Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kedishanu b'mitzvotah v'zivanu l'shmoah kol shofar. Blessed are you, Yahweh Eloheinu, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us to hear and respond to the call of the shofar. Somebody younger has a lot more wind. Yeah, he's right there. Why is he sitting there? <laughs> <clears throat> Father, as we come before you this day on your Shabbat, we ask that you guide us through your word. Give us the wisdom and the understanding that you want us to have from your word. Know each one of us and what we need. Touch us with that which we need to have in order to move on in your word. Walking in your word, in our life. Guide us into all truth, Father. B'shem Yehoshua. Amen. 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 And the readings today, uh, and today, by the way, is Shabbat Shuvah. And we'll find out here in, in a minute what Shuvah is. It, means, it actually means to repent and turn back. Not to the very beginning, because no, none of us can go all the way back mm -hmm. to the very beginning. But we turn back where we are, and we start from this point and go forward walking in obedience to His word. In the readings today, we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 21, starting in verse 10, and we'll be reading through chapter 25 and verse 19. The half Torah is kind of a, uh, we've already done what they call a half Torah in Isaiah. So actually today, what, what I'm going to be doing is, uh, in, in connection with Shabbat Shabbat, we're going to start in Hosea 14, chapter, I mean, yeah, chapter 14, starting in verse 2 through 10, and then we're going to go on through a whole bunch of stuff that I got planned. We're going to actually talk about Galatians 3.29, okay? So, and we'll see where that goes from that. <clears throat> but the first thing we're going to read right now, does anybody know what it is? Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And this is just in case y'all didn't get it last time. Okay. And <clears throat> while while everybody's turning over to this psalm, you realize this is a psalm of David, David, in Psalm 27, and the name David is the number 1732. If you haven't got it you know, written down, you might want to look it up. The word comes from the number 1730, and the Hebrew word is, is dod. Dod? What is the number again? 1732. Comes from 1730. In a way, it, literally it means to boil. In a figurative sense, the word means to love, as in the beloved. By implication, the name means a love token. You may have thought of that. David was given as a love token. He was given as a symbol. He was given as a type, a shadow, a picture of the Mashiach. You may have thought about that. The word also means an uncle. <laughs> as in a blood relative. <clears throat> and in verse 1 of Psalm 27, it says a psalm of David. And then he says, Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Remember the word salvation. There should be the word deliverance. So Yahweh is my light and my deliverance. Whom shall I fear? <coughs> If we have made Yahweh our light, and if he is our deliverance, then what in the world have we got to fear? If you haven't made him your light, and if you haven't made him your deliverance, then you've got a lot to be afraid of. And then it says, Yahweh is the strength of my life. 
word strength is the number 4580. What is the word my o's? The figurative sense of the word means a defense. You know, army, you know, anybody ever play chess, right? The best defense in chess is a strong offense. Anybody ever realize that this Bible, this, this word is called our what? Our sword? You know, a sword is an offensive weapon. A shield is a defensive weapon. We don't call this a shield. We call it our sword. He is our shield. He is our defense, right? And that's what David's talking about. He is his shield. He is his defense. The Magen David is the shield or the defense of David. And who is that? Yahweh. He is my defense. Yahweh is the defense of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If Yahweh is defending me, who is there to be afraid of? In verse 2, When the wicked came against me to eat up or to devour my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. And what is the this? Referring back to verse 1, Yahweh is my light and my deliverance. That's who cannot fear. That's his shield. In verse 4 he says, One thing, actually the word thing is not in there, but one, one thing I have desired of Yahweh, and he said, That will I seek. Notice what he is seeking for. And then the question is, Are we seeking for the same thing? And remember the scripture says that David was a man after his own heart. One I have desired of Yahweh, and he said, That will I seek that I may dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life. Word house there is 1004, 1004. Bait. It means a house, but it also means a family. Has anybody ever thought, thought about it that we are dwelling in the family of Yahweh right now the minute we come to Him? Now I know some of the other members of family we don't always care for. <laughs> we don't always like them and they don't always do right, okay? But I mean nobody can be as perfect as us, right? <laughs> <laughs> that I may dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life to behold the beauty of Yahweh and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble, it's kind of like referring to the time of the tribulation, isn't it? He shall hide me in his pavilion. That's why that first day of the seventh month is come, called Yom HaKesed, the day of hiding. He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high up on a rock. We're going to be hidden on a rock. And who is the rock? Messiah Yehoshua. In verse 6, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to Yahweh. And now he's speaking directly to Yahweh. He says, Hear, Yahweh, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. You said, Seek my face. My heart said to you, Your face, Yahweh, I will seek. Remember the word that's translated face means presence. So you're seeking the presence of Yahweh. He's always present in His Word. He wrote the Word, and then this Word became flesh. You know what it says over in the Gospel of John? Though the Word became flesh. The Word is the Father. The Father became the Son. So when He stood up in the Gospel of John, He said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Who is He? What commandments do we keep? The ones He gave us, the ones He wrote with His finger on the stones. Verse 9, he said, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me. Elohim of my deliverance. The El or the creator of my deliverance. When my father and my mother forsake me, then Yahweh will take care of me. Teach me your way, Yahweh, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. And then the implication in verse 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. Verse 14, wait on Yahweh. Be of good courage. 
You know, you have to have courage, right? You have to have courage to stand in there. And if you don't see the goodness in the next five minutes, just wait. Because it's coming because he said so, if you believe his word. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on Yahweh. That's a beautiful psalm, isn't it? Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy in chapter 21 and we're going to get into the, into the Torah for today. After all, that's why we're here, right? In verse 10, <clears throat> actually starting last week in, in this chapter 21, we started a lot of the, the instructions that he was giving the people as they were coming into the promised land and getting ready to live. And here we have a continuation, verse 10. He says, when you go out to war against your enemies... And Yahweh Eloheka delivers them into your hand. You might ever notice that? When you go out to war and Yahweh delivers them into your hand, does that mean that he's going to deliver them over so you can kill them? That's what he says, isn't it? We always get so afraid that, well, we're going to have to do it ourselves. And he didn't say, no, go out there and do it all by yourself and then come tell me what happened. <laughs> he said, when you go to war and he's going to go before us, is he not? When you go out to war against your enemies and Yahweh Eloheka delivers them into your hand and you take them captive and you see among the captives a beautiful woman and desire her and would take her for your wife, then you shall bring her home to your house and she shall shave her head and trim her nails. She shall put off the clothes of her captivity, remain in your house and mourn her father and her mother a full month. After that you may go into her and be her husband and she shall be your wife. He never said that you can't take a woman from that, you know, that place. But at the same time, later on we'll find out that if that woman wants to maintain her false gods or her false heritage of wherever she came from, then she's no longer, you know, what you thought she was going to be. We read these words and we have to look at all the depth of understanding and meaning behind them. You just can't take things on the surface because we can build all kinds of pictures on surface things. And in verse 14, It shall be, if you have no delight in her, then you shall set her free, but you certainly shall not sell her for money. You shall not treat her brutally, because you have humbled her. That word humbled is the number 6031 in, in the concordance, if you want to look it up. <clears throat> it can mean brutally, as in she were brutal, brutal, or forced her into something. Or it can mean to submit to, as in, you know, a woman submitted to the husband in marriage, in matrimony, and so forth. But you don't, you know, if, if you treated her this way, you don't pile insult on top of insult, is what this verse is talking about. The humanity of what Yahweh has for his people to treat other people with, whether they're enemies or not, you still use humanity to treat them, right? You don't treat them like they're scum of the earth. And I know we sometimes think about that. Every time we ever look at something and we use the term trailer trash, that's what we're talking, that's the way we're thinking about those people. Even when we use that term. Right? You can't, you know, as long as you continue to think that way, then the words are going to come out of our mouth. We have to learn to change how we think. Because you don't ever can tell how Yahweh sees that person or those people, right? Remember I said this a long time ago, if we treat everybody like we're talking to the Messiah himself, then it changes how we treat people and how we think about people, who we are. It changes our relationship with people. And when we do that, then it forces them to have the same relationship back, whether we realize it or not. <clears throat> Verse 15. If a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children... The loved and the unloved, and if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, before we go on, this is not saying that you should go out and get a second wife. It's just saying, if you do. Okay? In the very beginning, how many wives did he make for Adam? One. Okay. <laughs> and the word firstborn there in verse 15 is the number 1060. It's the Hebrew word bekor. It's where we get the term bikurim, or the law of bikurim, or the law of the firstborn. Remember, the firstborn son of the family is the one who has the right of the firstborn and what belongs to that person. Okay? 
But what he's trying to say here, that if you have two wives and you love one and you don't like, don't love the other. Isn't that exactly what happened between Rachel and Leah? Mm -hmm. But he said that, that, that the firstborn son, excuse 10, me? 1060, was that number? 1060. Oh. <clears throat> so in the firstborn there, 1060 in verse 15, and then in verse 16 it says, Then it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his son. To bequeath is, is like when a person dies and you leave them an inheritance. You know, to bequeath. He must not bestow the firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved who is truly the firstborn. Verse 17, But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. And that word beginning there is 7225. Reshit. Where do we see that word? In Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning. In the reshit. In the firstborn. In the beginning of his strength. And it's a reference to the Messiah Yehoshua. In him, everything was created. I don't know how many people have ever really looked up those words and seen that they're the same thing. And, and go back and look at him. And how much does the scripture talk about firstborn? <laughs> it's all over the place. In verse 18, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son. Yeah, I remember reading this passage one time. We had a couple that had come, you know, and, and this young man was, was there for the first time and he'd never really heard anything about Torah. And everything was over after that day and somebody asked him, did he, you know, did he learn anything? He said, yeah. You better behave yourself or people will kill you with rocks. <laughs> <laughs> If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and who when they have chastened him will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city to the gate of his city. This is not talking about a six or seven or eight year old child. We know that. It's talking about someone who's old enough to know better, old enough to, to, to do things what they're supposed to do. In verse 20, and they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. That word glutton is the number 2151. It's the Hebrew word zalal. Glutton. We think of the term gluttony. We think of anybody who overeats or over, you know, anything, you know. In, in, in. The definition of the word means to be vile. In the Hebrew, to be vile, you know, wicked, evil, to be loose morally, to not have any kind of scruples about anything. They don't care what they do, you know. It also means worthless and it means wasteful. And then the word uh, drunkard, the number is 5435 in the Hebrew. And the word there is sobe. The phrase here is and or the sobe and sobe. <clears throat> that word drunkard, it means a, a drinker of wine. But it, it, it also it means one who drinks hard. Does anybody, you know, understand? I mean, you might have a little drink every now and then or, or you know, or drink something, but this is somebody who drinks hard. I mean, it's, you know, Put it in. It'll give me a glass. Give me two bottles. You know, this is a noisy drinker, much reveling, loud. You know, you know. Some people when they drink, they get loud and they get you know, you know, extremely loud and boisterous. <clears throat> but notice there, in verse twenty-one, then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil. Most Bibles have the word person in that verse there, the evil person. But if you'll notice, the word, in, the word person is in italic, which means it's not in the original Hebrew text. The translators put the word person in there because they're thinking that you're trying to get rid of the person. And that's not the purpose of the whole thing. You kill that person because you're trying to eliminate the evil from the camp. And if you don't get rid of the evil, then it goes to the next one. Do you realize how many times that people, you know, this is talking about being a drunkard and drinking and all this kind of stuff, not just murder or rape or anything. We don't even kill people for murder or rape anymore. 
put them in jail, feed them for 400 years or whatever it is. But if they were killed, that evil would be destroyed and the next person might stop and think, well, I don't want that evil because they really don't want the punishment. But we don't have people that think that way today. Not in our society. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, so you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Verse 22, If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. Notice carefully what that says. It says you don't take a man out there and hang him till they're dead. It says if you <clears throat> put to death and you hang him on a tree. The killing took place first. Then he was hung up on a tree for all to see. They didn't hang him on something and wait till he died. They killed him and then hung him up on a tree or on the pole, on the gallows, okay? I don't know if people ever really noticed that. That's what it says. <clears throat> the word hang is the number 8518. It's a Hebrew word, tolah. It means to suspend, especially to gibbet. <laughs> especially to gibbet. Gibbet. G-I-B-B-E-T. To gibbet. And that means to hang them by chains from a cross beam on exhibition. <laughs> you remember how some of the old timey things, you know, in, in, in old English and so forth, they had the stocker, the, the, the stocks out in the middle of the square, you know, and if somebody did something wrong, they put them in them things and put the, the board down around their head and their arms and everything and put them out there, you know, and left them for two or three days or whatever. Can you imagine what that would be like? I mean, your back would be hurting after a while, wouldn't it? But the hanging after death is to be an example to others, right? <clears throat> to bring fear and to induce obedience. Yahweh doesn't want to punish anybody. He wants people to be obedient, right? Go back to Genesis chapter 40. <clears throat> I'm not sure people remember that we had 40 chapters in Genesis. You remember this was the prayer, I mean, not the prayer, but the, uh, the dream <clears throat> that uh, one of the, the bakers had, you know, to, to Joseph when he was in prison and he gave him his dream. And he interpreted his dream here and he said, within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat your flesh from you. He's going to lift your head off. I mean, he's going to cut off your head. Now, after his head was cut off, would you say he did? And then they're going to hang him on a tree, and while he's hanging on the tree, then the birds are going to eat his flesh. But he was killed first and then hung up. I don't know if we've ever really got a hold of that. Because our society says, oh, we got to hang him by the neck until dead. When they cut this guy's head off, he didn't have no neck to hang him by. Now, go back to, to Deuteronomy there. In verse... Uh, 23. His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which Yahweh Eloheka is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is accursed of Elohim. <clears throat> I, uh, I want us to get something real clear here. Remove and bury the body. It shall not remain on the tree overnight to prevent the defilement of the land. A dead body is a primary source of making unclean. You remember how we go through it? If we touch a dead body or if we're in a room, you know, we become unclean and we have to bathe and wash and be unclean until evening and so forth. So death makes unclean. And here he's saying that the land's going to be defiled by this thing. If the body begins to decompose, which is corruption, right? Then the impurity spreads far and wide, and this is the main source of various plagues. If you go back in history and look at all the plagues that occurred in the world, bubonic plague and all those kind of things were carried by rats and fleas and all this kind of stuff, 
and it was the, the, the filth and the uncleanness that everybody had which caused this mass spreading of all these germs and viruses and so forth. <clears throat> but here's their curse of Elohim. Go to the Gospel of John in chapter 19. John 19. Now, <clears throat> we all understand that most of what we call New Testament scriptures are copies, you know, from, from Greek texts, and there's a lot of different, and they're all different, you know, and trying to make up something. But in this verse, uh, chapter 19 and in verse 31, it's talking about when Messiah died on the execution stake, and he said, it is finished, and he bowed ahead and died, right? Then verse 31 says, therefore, because it was a preparation that the body should not remain on the cross or the execution stake on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Yehudi asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Had we always had the understanding that, well, you can't leave a body hanging on the execution stake on the Sabbath? Based on what this says, right? But in Torah, why was the reason for not leaving the body on there overnight? To defile, to defile the land. Had nothing to do with whether it was the Sabbath or not. Now, I'm just trying to say that it's so easy to get a misunderstanding in your mind from skimming over some little verse, you know, and thinking, well, that's what it said. And who knows what the person wrote that wrote it. He might have thought that. But if we don't filter everything back through the Torah, then we get a misunderstanding. Where in Torah does it say that the body's not supposed to be on the execution stake on Sabbath? doesn't say that, does it? It just says that it won't be hung up there, what, overnight? I just point that out so that as we read, as we study, we need to make sure that we read the words very carefully, read them three or four times, go over them, and ask ourselves what this is really saying. <clears throat> A cursory glimpse of Scripture won't give you what you need. Okay, go back to Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Notice in that verse 23, that his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which Yahweh Elohim is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is cursed of Elohim. Now he had become cursed, right? If you'll notice in, in, in Galatians, they always talk about, you know, he became a curse for us, right? That's true, but doesn't it say that anybody who's hung on the tree becomes cursed? The cursing in what we become is because of our disobedience to the word. And when he got hung on the execution tank, he took the curse that comes to us so that we don't have to die. We can confess our sin to him and he is faithful to forgive and then we don't have to die, right? That eternal, that, that eternal death. <clears throat> Chapter 22. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray. Do y'all realize how fast we went through that chapter? <laughs> it's only been about 28 minutes I was keeping track. You setting a record? Setting a record. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and hide yourself from them or ignore. That word hide there really means ignore. <laughs> and ignore yourself from them. You shall certainly bring them back to your brother. And if your brother is not near you, or if you do not know him, then you shall bring it to your own house, and it shall remain with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. You all ever thought about how hard it is to know you've got a brother and not know him? But have you ever thought about if we're all in the same family of Yahweh, and there are other groups around the world someplace in the same family of Yahweh, we have other brothers and sisters somewhere that we don't know. And one day we hope to meet them. But that's what this is talking about. When the tribes of Israel were camping around the tabernacle, there were, what, two million people out there. And, and it's very possible that you went your whole life and never met the guy living in the middle tent on the other side. <laughs> right? Wasn't two miles away, but, you know, you never got there. <clears throat> in verse 3, you shall do the same with his donkey. And so shall you do with his garment, with any, with any lost thing of your brother's which he has lost and you have found. 
you shall do likewise. You must not hide yourself or ignore. You remember the old thing that we heard when we were growing up, finders keepers? That's a lie. It belongs to whoever lost it. <laughs> Even the penny laying on the parking lot ain't yours. <laughs> Verse 4, you shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fall down along the road and hide yourself from them. You shall surely help him lift up again. Is this not talking about common decency and dealing with people? This happens to be within the family. <clears throat> but we have a duty to restore or to protect that which belongs to our brother. Go to Exodus chapter 2. <clears throat> All my pages get stuck together. In Exodus chapter 2 and in verse uh, 4 and 5. In this passage, it's where Moses, you know, and, and Pharaoh had already issued the decree, you know, that all the men, children, you know, had to be put in the river to be offered up to the Nile God. They had to be killed, right? And, of course, you know, how many people were doing it? Think about, you know, we only have one story here of one person that was saved in an ark, and all the rest of them were being killed by being thrown in the river, and Pharaoh was probably saying, you know, offer them up to the Nile God, right? All the gods will get them. But here in verse 4, or actually in verse 3, but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Now we know from the movie that she followed the baby, right? <laughs> but notice, his sister stood afar off, verse 5, Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. Her sister, or his sister, was watching and doing all this, and we know what took place. But wasn't she there to try to protect? They weren't about to let that baby die. They weren't about to let that baby go the way of all the others, okay? Somebody cared enough to make sure. And then who actually gave him the name Moses? Pharaoh's daughter did. <coughs> and what does it mean? Drawn. To be drawn out or drawn out. And the one who was drawn out became the one who draws the rest of us out. And today, we get drawn out of the world and follow Moshe because Moshe said, come out. Because Yahweh said to Moses, go tell them. What are we supposed to come out of? The world. It's the same thing. Same thing happening. <coughs> But notice, in, in, in brother or enemy, we have a duty to restore and to protect. Brother or enemy, doesn't matter. What they do, what they think, what they feel, what they say has no bearing on how you react in any situation. How we react is our choice. We can choose to walk in obedience to what the Torah says, or we can choose to be affected by what the rest of the world thinks. And what does Yahweh think about what the rest of the world thinks? What do you say? All the nations of the world are like a drop in a bucket. Don't mean nothing. Go to Romans chapter 12. Now, in this particular commentary here in the book of Romans written by Paul, he uh, is giving the people, I mean, have you ever stopped and think about Paul was called to do a certain thing, right? And he was called by the Mashiach to go out and reach people, and, and he was taught to say, he told Paul a long time ago, I'm going to show you all the things that you're going to have to suffer for my sake. Does anybody realize how much Paul suffered? 
and yet he chose to keep on doing what Yahweh told him to do. You reckon people laying around tried to change him for what he was doing? Try to get him to do something else? Well, I got a different word than, than, than you got. You know, and Paul, you need to be saying this or you need to be doing that. But he still, he continued on in what he felt like Yahweh spoke to him to do. Are you supposed to live your life based on what somebody else thinks? Maybe y'all are all supposed to do what I tell you to do. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Oh, okay. You're supposed to do what Yahweh said to do. Is that true? And in order to know that, you have to read it and study it. That's what Paul learned what the Torah meant when he met the Mashiach on the road to Damascus, right? Because he saw the light. And what does it say in Isaiah? Anybody who doesn't speak according to this law, it's because there's no light in them. I think that's kind of interesting. But in verse 18, Paul writes, If it is possible... As much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, and now he's quoting, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Yahweh. If we try to take vengeance on somebody for something that they did, aren't we trying to set ourselves up in the position of being God over him? Verse 20 says, Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. You see, on your part, Yahweh is being glorified. If the enemy continues to be evil, then Yahweh is being blasphemed. And Yahweh will take vengeance. Have you ever thought about what he can do to somebody? <laughs> I mean, he can make them like they never existed, right? Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You realize that's an instruction. We have the ability to do that. He's not going to tell you to do something you can't do. Overcome evil with good. That's a choice that we have to make. And we have the ability to do it. <clears throat> Go back to Deuteronomy. In verse 5, as we get into these verses here, we all know that there's often been a lot of doctrines and, and, and teachings and everything else established on these words. And it's hard when we read these words to remember that these weren't written last year. These words are not written in our society. It's not written for what America thinks. It's not written for what Europe thinks. It's not written for what fashion people think. Okay? Okay? This is written for Yahweh to establish his rules and regulations between men and women and his people and what they're supposed to do. In verse 5, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment for all who do so are an abomination to Yahweh Eloheka. Now the question is, what today is a man's garment and a woman's garment? And what was it 3,500 years ago? 3,500 years ago, they all kind of wore the same thing, didn't they? Robes. How many of them wore pants? Don't think anybody did until he told the priesthood to start making pants to wear under their robes, you know, right? But as things change and as things develop, he's not telling you exactly what type of clothes, but it's obvious today whether a person is trying to wear women's clothes or if a woman's trying to wear men's clothes or whatever it is, they make this desire. And what do we call this? The practice of dressing in clothes with the opposite sex? It's a form of sexual perversion, and it's known as transvestism. Transvestite is somebody who tries to convert to one or the other, and they go through operations and all this kind of stuff, to try to become something that they're not. And then we have a whole society of people today telling them, well, you can go get a sex change operation because you were really a man, but you were born a woman, but you were supposed to be the other. Or people decide they want to do that. Is that like a duck decides they want to be a chicken? Or maybe a dog wants to be a giraffe. I mean, isn't that, isn't that what we're saying, that, that he made mistakes? Did he make any mistakes? No, he didn't make mistakes. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> this, is, this is important because... And the thing about it is, our children, especially in public schools and out, you know, in movies and everything else, what are they seeing? They're seeing what the world thinks is the right way to live. 
And what is the world calling these things now as it happens? Alternate lifestyles. Right? What is the, what do you mean alternate lifestyle? What is, what is this? I mean, where did that come from? Isn't that the same thing as calling bad good? I mean, that's exactly what they're saying, okay? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Verse 1 says, imitate me as I also imitate the Mashiach. That's what he's saying to do. Verse 2, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions as I delivered them to you. That word tradition there is being the Jewish traditionary customs and rules and regulations. They've been passed down. But I want you to know that the head of every man is the Mashiach. The head of the woman is man and the head of the Mashiach is Yahweh. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. I don't know if people ever thought about it or not, but a man you know, in a Christian church, he goes into church and what takes off his hat. A Jewish man goes into synagogue and puts on a kippah. Anybody ever notice something different about that? Do you know in the Marine Corps, you're taught when you go in the Marine Corps that you have to remove your hat, you know, out of respect, you know, if you go to church or any place else or an enclosed building, you have to take off your hat. You can't have anything on your head. What's that based on? A misunderstanding of these scriptures. The only thing I'm trying to say is we have things built into our society today in the American culture that people have known about and, and, and do and, and everything else without ever understanding what or where it came from or why. If you were to try to go against what those regulations say in the military and try to obey the Bible, what's going to happen? You're going to be in big trouble, you know. Can you imagine being in a stockade just because you wouldn't, you know, take off or put on a hat, one or the other? But those are not going to happen. <clears throat> if we come on down in verse 5, but every woman who prays or prophesying with her head covered dishonors her head, for that is one the same as if her head were shaved. Read again. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one the same as if her head were shaved. But it's talking about the hair, is it not? So the whole thing is talking about one, you know, one wearing hair, one not wearing hair, or something like that. What is this man then that's going to want to be covered? What I'm trying to get at, that phrase, in verse 4, every man praying or prophesying, having, hanging down over his head, is talking about men who have hair like women, and they're trying to look like women. They're trying to act like women. That's what this passage is all about. And if you look in the actual Greek text, the Greek text doesn't say having the head covered. The Greek text says having hanging down over the head. All of it's about whether or not somebody's trying to act or look like a man or a woman, one or the other, other than what they are. And yet we have doctrine, tradition, we have groups running. Did you know that there's messianic groups running right now? If, if you don't put on a keypaw, they won't let you in. Or if you don't have, you know, if a woman doesn't have long hair, they won't let her in. Are, are all kinds of rules and regulations based on misinterpretation of English words which are a misinterpretation and translation from the, from the original Greek anyway. And nobody ever bothers to go back and find out what it really says. But when you get through all of this fussing and everything, you go down to verse 16 of this chapter. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the called out ones of Yahweh. If we go back into the Torah, if we go back into Genesis and Exodus, okay, <clears throat> we find that the women there who had on veils and had their head covered and wearing all this kind of stuff, what were they doing? Most of the time they were prostitutes. <laughs> so today they're trying to get everybody to dress like the prostitutes used to. Is that what it is? <laughs> I'm just asking questions here because if we study these things out and compare these scriptures, then, then they should give us a new, new, new understanding. Okay. <clears throat> Before we leave that Corinthians in verse 17, we already leave. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. But first of all, when you come together as a group or an ecclesia or a called out group, I hear that there are divisions among you and in part I believe it. 
For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized or be made manifest among you. There must be factions. I think some of you know, talks about heresies and everything. It, it, it talks about people following traditions of men. There's going to be a lot of people out there bringing in traditions of men. And how do you know whether they're traditions of men or whether they are the word of Yahweh? By studying the word. That's what tells you what the difference is. You can't go through life basing your life on what somebody else thinks. And, and, and I'm not trying to be facetious, but when you're trying to talk to people about Bible now and they say, well, I think or I feel or well, I just believe, who cares? I, I, but I understand how hard that statement is. But until you get the same decision, you can't always just, you know, not hurt somebody's feelings if them continuing to believe that's going to bring them death. What are you going to do? You've got to give them the truth, right? And if you don't, sometimes, and when you go away, if you didn't give them the truth, then they think, well, they believe it also. They believe it the same way I do. If somebody comes in here trying to teach some kind of a false doctrine or something that I don't agree with, I can't let it go by unchallenged. Because if I do, then everybody else begins to think, well, I believe the same thing, and I can't let that happen. Especially if I think it's wrong. But anyway, we'll get into Scripture later on that. Okay, go back to... Deuteronomy. Hmm. But notice in that verse 5, a woman wearing anything pertaining to a man or shall a man put on a woman's garment is not just the men or the women, it's both. All who do so are an abomination to Yahweh Eloheka. And verse 6, this particular verse 6 here is the commandment that in the, the, uh, the Talmud they say is the least commandment of all. The least commandment of all. If a bird's nest happens to be before you along the way at any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs with the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. If you take the mother and the eggs or the babies and just, you know, eat them all, then they're, they're wiped out totally, right? If you take the mother, then what happens to the babies? They're going to die anyway. Verse 7, you shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself that it may be well with you and you may prolong your days. Notice this is one of those commandments that has a promise of long life associated with doing what it said to do. And it's associated with life. And it continues in a propagation of life, which is what Yahweh intended in the first place. How can people say this is the least of all the commandments? If it preserves life. Has you ever noticed how society... <laughs> change this thing around and they put their understanding on something whether it's true or not. <clears throat> what does Messiah actually say about which commandment is most important? Doesn't he say if you broke one you broke them all? But he says the greatest of all is what? Shema. Yisrael, Yahweh Elohech, Yahweh Echad. Hero Israel. Yahweh. Yahweh is one. He says that's the most important. Because if you don't believe he is one, then you just follow all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> In verse 8, when you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof. You know, back then they made houses with flat roofs. And a parapet means a fence or a rail around the roof of the house so people can't fall off. Because a lot of times people, you know, slip up on the roof. <clears throat> When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring blood guiltiness on your house if anyone falls from it. Does that mean you're responsible for the life of the people that come into your house? You're responsible for the people that are there, right? And you're supposed to do everything you can to make it as safe as possible for them. Is that not, you know? <laughs> In verse 9, You shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed, lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. Different seeds. You can't what plant, you know, wheat and, bar and barley or different kinds of grains out in the field because they'll cross pollinate. They don't tell you what you'll get. You'll lose the purity of whatever it is. And yet today, our society has tried to change everything. We change all kinds of seeds. You know, we make hybrids. We make all this kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, the things that we're planting and growing today ain't nothing like they were originally. And how many of them have the same nutrition that they used to have? The land's not protected. So, I mean, they're not getting the things that we need, right? Y'all ever stop and think about how hard it is to eat healthy? 
I mean, we all read labels, right? If you read very many labels, you'll realize real quick you ain't eating healthy. <laughs> I don't care what you think. <clears throat> Verse 10, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Anybody ever noticed how much bigger an ox is than a donkey? One of them is stronger than the other. I get this impression in my mind that here's the, you know, the ox plowing and the donkey hanging on the other end of the bow and he ain't even touching the ground. You, know? <laughs> you don't mix these things. Unequally yoked, if that's what they, you know. Would you call them unequally yoked? Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter six. You remember Paul, and, and I forget now where it is in Scripture, but he was talking about when he finally went up to Jerusalem and they gave him the right hand of fellowship and they became partners with him, you know. All of us are trying to teach the truth of the word whenever we're talking to somebody, right? But what if you're partnered with somebody who believes something different from you? Then you're trying to get people to go one way and they're trying to get them to go somewhere else. And what's happening? Then it's an unequal type thing there and you really couldn't ever make any headway because you're trying to push one way and they're trying to push another way and things don't work right. Here in verse 14, he writes to us, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What is an unbeliever? Somebody who doesn't believe the word of Yahweh. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Now, if you look at fellowship as being partners, right? Then what partnership does a righteous person have with a sinner? <laughs> what is it? Is there any? There can't any good come out of that. And what communion has light with darkness? Remember the word communion just means a sharing. To have communion, it means to share. So what sharing has light with darkness? You go into a room at night and it's totally dark and you flip the switch and light comes on, where'd the darkness go? It's gone. How can you have darkness and light at the same time? The only way you can is if you dim the light, right? And you dim the light, and the, and the dimmer the light gets, well, then the greater the darkness is, right? Now, all of a sudden, you get the light so dim, you can't see anything in it. Have you ever noticed sometimes in a room that you may have objects in a room, some of them may be blue or green or red or what have you, but if you dim the light and get it down dim enough, you eventually reach a point where you can't tell what color it is. You know it's there, and you know what color it's supposed to be, but you can't see it because there's not enough light to see it. Light is what helps us to identify things. The only way we can identify truth is through the light of what? What this word says. You try to throw some other kind of artificial light in there and it's not going to show up the same truth, the same colors. Has anybody ever bought something in a store and then took it home and said, boy, it's a different color here than it was when I bought it? Or if you buy it in the store and take it outside in the, in the sunlight, what happens? I mean, I don't think we've ever really associated that, but when you buy something in the store, it's one way, and you take it outside and look at it another, and, and it's the same way with Yahweh's Word. You go try to look at things aside from what His Word says, and you have a totally different picture or light or color or something than what He says. If you want the truth, then you have to look at it in His light. This is what He's saying. What communion has light with darkness? And what accord has the Messiah with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of Yahweh with idols? For you are the temple of the living Yahweh, as Yahweh has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. If he's going to be your Elohim, you have to do what he said do. If he's not, then you don't. Then your Elohim, your creator, your God, have to be what? Something or somebody else. And generally because we follow what we want, because we all have that bent towards you know, selfishness, then we become our own God, right? It's a tough thought. Okay. Go back to 22. In verse 11, 
Well, I was looking at this last night, and, and <clears throat> in most English Bibles, we have the verse that says, You shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as wool and linen mixed together. Most Bibles have those words such as in there, right? But if you'll notice that they're in there, they're in italics, which means they're not in the original text. So if you take those out, then the actual text says, you shall not wear a garment of different sorts, wool and linen mixed together. And those words, a garment of different sorts is one Hebrew word. The number for it is 8162. And the Hebrew word there is the word sha'atnez. Or, if we translate it into English, it becomes Lindsay Woolsey. Now, there may be some of you here <clears throat> that remembers like I do back in the old days when we used to have the Mott's Five and Dime stores. You know? And you could go into the Mott's Five and Dime, and generally, if you go all the way to the back on the right hand side, they had all that place back there for clothes hanging up there, and they had a special section up there that had a sign over it that said Lindsay Woolsey. And these were clothes that were made out of linen and wool carded and mixed together which is exactly what he says you're not supposed to wear but you know if somebody's teaching well all that old law done away with we can do whatever we want to so then they go do that right because you know made money with it but that's what that is Sha'atnez or Lindsay Woolsey and, and, and I think most everybody's heard me say this before to card fabric together means you take fabric you know and they got those brushes with the, with the metal needles on them you know and you put your block of cotton or something in there and then you begin to brush these things together and it stretches them out in the long fibers and then you can take those fibers and go to the to the spinning wheel and spin them and make a single fiber out of those fibers when you mix those fibers together the linen and the wool together since one is animal fiber and one is you know they're going to have different strengths but even then he said don't do it did he say you can't have nylon and cotton or polyester and cotton, he didn't have that. He said you don't make linen and wool because there are specific references to those two factors in the scripture. Verse 12, you shall make tassels on the four corners of the clothing with which you cover. Most Bibles have the word yourself in there. That's not in there either. The implication is you're covering yourself. <laughs> in verse 12, that word tassel, the number is 1434. And it's a Hebrew word, gedalim. It means twisted threads. <clears throat> it means a festoon, you know. You know festoon, we all know what festoons are. They're them fancy things hanging off of curtains and, you know, lampshades and stuff like that, you know, that they decorate with. It also means fringe. It literally means an ornament of twisted thread ending in loose threads from the Hebrew. One of the main reasons that they used to make garments and when they would weave them, it's kind of like we have on the prayer shawls that people weave and wear today. <clears throat> you can see these fibers running crosswise and then these fibers are the ones that run in the length of the cloth. <clears throat> and if you leave these hanging down and tie a knot in them, then you can actually inspect them to find out one could be linen and one could be wool, or you can actually see what they are. And you can see the difference between the two. And then they would tie this, and this became a fringe. Now, when he says you shall make a tassel, which means that you want, you put a festoon to the fringe, so the tassel, and if we look over numbers, then you put what? The blue thread. They didn't say make them like that. This is tradition, but the blue thread can be added into this fringe. This is a way of doing that, not the only way. I want everybody to understand, you know, we put a blue thread to the fringe. This is one way of doing it. There are other ways it can be done. Okay. <clears throat> In verse 13, now we're talking about marriage and so forth. If any man takes a wife and goes into her and detests her <clears throat> and charges her with shameful conduct and brings a bad name on her and says, I took this woman when I came to her, I found she was not a virgin. 
Then the father and the mother of the young woman shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. The one thing that I'd like the people to think about as we read these scriptures, you know, talking about the virginity of the woman, was it important in ancient Hebrew thought for a woman to be a virgin? Did anybody ever understand the reason why? Because a Messiah was going to be born of a virgin. So the desire of every woman then was to be the one that he chose to give birth to the Messiah. Isn't that an amazing thought? And then we read in the book of Daniel where it talks about the false Messiah, the Antichrist. He's not going to what? He's not going to have any care for the desire of women. And people think, oh, well, he's supposed to be, you know, homosexual or something. He's not going to like women or he's not going to like whatever. But it's got nothing to do with that because the desire of women is to give birth to the Mashiach. And what he's really saying is he's not going to care anything about the Messiah. In fact, the word Antichrist doesn't mean against. It means instead of. And he's the one that's going to go into the temple and set himself up and show himself to be the God. And people are going to think so for a while. But then when they find out he's really not, then it's going to be what? Run for cover. <laughs> but it's going to be too late. <clears throat> so in verse 15, The father and the mother of the young woman shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. Huh. <laughs> Boy, we went a long way on, on that one hour, didn't we? Okay. <clears throat> but in verse 16, And the young woman's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man as wife, and he detests her. Now he has charged her with shameful conduct, saying, I found your daughter was not a virgin, and yet these are the evidences of my daughter's virginity and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. The proof, and once they find out that, that she is vindicated by this proof, verse 18, then the elders of that city shall take that man and punish him. When you bring charges against somebody else and it turns out to be false, then you should be char or punished the same way or whatever you were trying to get that person to do. Verse 19, and they shall find him 100 of silver, shekels is implied, and give to the father of the young woman because he has brought a bad name on the virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He cannot divorce her all his days. Well, I'm sure today that we probably wouldn't think that that was a very good thing for her to have to live with somebody like that. But if you're very careful about who you marry up front, whether it's in Yahweh's plan or not, then you don't have to worry about those things. And most of the time, people get married, they never give a second thought to whether it's Yahweh's plan for their life or not. They don't know. They don't know nothing don't care. All they're looking for is some type of self-gratification in that situation. Not realizing that the things that a person really needs can't be met by the man or woman in that relationship. Anybody who's looking for that other person to satisfy their needs is totally self-absorbed in their own selfishness and will never have satisfaction from that marriage. Can't happen. Verse 20. But if the thing is true, and the truth of the evidence of the virginity are not found for the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stone, because she had done a disgraceful thing in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house, so you shall put away the evil from among you. Again, the word person is not in there. <clears throat> in our society today, how far do you think you'd have to search to find a woman who had proof of virginity by the time they got married? <clears throat> would that not be saying then that our society has come a long way we have an evil society we may not realize it. we've been conditioned over the years you know but compared to what the scripture says what does it say about our society is it any wonder then people who think that they're following scripture Islamic people I'm not trying to say that they have any you know any truth in what they do but the one thing about it is they look at the United States and they call us what? The great Satan. And I hate to say it, but in reality, they're true. It's right. It is true. We are. As a society. Overall. Now, what they do is not any better. I'm not saying that. but Verse 22. If a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the, and the woman... 
so you shall put away the evil from Israel. Does that say one or both die? It says both, doesn't it? <clears throat> we don't have to turn over there, but just think back a little bit, you know, in the Gospel of John when they caught that woman right in the act, you know, of having <clears throat> adultery with that man. Now, adultery means that a woman who was married, you know, with another one, so she would have been married, right? So they brought the woman, but they didn't bring the man, remember? And they said, well, the Torah, you know, in the, in the law, Moses said we're supposed to kill her, but what do you say? Did they lie? Yeah, they did, because the Torah didn't say you kill her. The Torah says, what, she killed both of them. And then it goes on, if we read the Scripture, it says, but they were testing him to see what he would say. Can you imagine testing the one that wrote it? To see what he would say about it? And then you understand why he said they didn't know me. If they'd known the Father, they'd know him. But they didn't know the Father because they didn't know him. Verse 23. If a young woman, a virgin, is betrothed to a husband, and a man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife, so you shall put away the evil from among you. If you'll notice how many times the word person has been placed in all these scriptures by the translators. They've never really understood. You're not trying to get rid of a person. You're trying to get rid of the evil, not the person. But if a man finds a betrothed young woman in the countryside, and the man forces her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. There is nothing in the woman, no sin worthy of death. For just as when a man rises against his neighbor and kills him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the countryside, and the betrothed young woman cried out, but there was no one to save her. That's giving her the benefit of the doubt. Have you ever noticed in our society today how quick we are to want to jump to the wrong conclusion about something or somebody? We always want to do that real quick. We assume the worst first, right? Have you ever noticed... The assumption, you know, they're, they're innocent until proven guilty. The, the a person arrested today in our society, they, what, they're automatically considered guilty. And then they have to go prove their innocence. Have you ever noticed that? The prosecuting don't have to prove their case. The other one has to prove the opposite of what they say. It's kind of different in our society. Different than what the word says. Verse 28, if a man finds a young woman who is a virgin who is not betrothed and he seizes her and lies with her and they are found out, then the man who lay with her shall give to the young woman's father 50 of silver and she shall be his wife because he has humbled her. He shall not be permitted to divorce her all his days. <clears throat> Boy, that's not happening in our society today. I mean, it goes on all the time. It ain't got nothing to do with getting married. But in that, I mean, that's the degeneration that our society has degenerated to. And you know the thing about it is, if you notice on the television, the news shows, the talk shows, nobody ever notices that. They can talk about things and they got these programs and everything to help this person and help that person, you know. But nobody ever came across the cause of it to begin with. When you throw out the law, then everybody can live however they want to. And, and you see the degenerative society that's been developed on account of that. In verse 30, A man shall not take his father's wife nor uncover his father's bed. Go over to 1 Corinthians. An interesting study, if anybody wants to do it on the internet, is to go into your internet on your search engine and put in the, the name of Corinth, of the city of Corinth, you know, in ancient times, and look at what's described of this city and how they lived in ancient times and what they did and the corruption that went on there. And then you begin to understand why Paul wrote two letters to these people in Corinth, you know. <clears throat> and in the second one, he said, I'm sending you this letter because when I come to you in person, he said, I, I, I think it'd be better for you to get the letter than what I do to you physically is what he's saying but in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5 in verses 1 and 2 he said it is actually reported 
There is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. He's saying, man, you people are doing something. You're supposed to be the children of Israel and you're doing things among you that's not even named among the Gentile nations. That a man has his father's wife. Isn't that what we just read over here? That he says, you know, you shall not take your father's wife nor uncover the father's bed. You're not to do that. And yet this is exactly what he's writing to these people in Corinth. If you're writing to somebody about doing that, and then he says what? Verse 2, And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. He's writing to people there and said, Y'all aren't even upset about it. In fact, you're puffed up, kind of proud of it. Isn't that what he's saying to these people? Do you understand the depravity that these people had sunk into? And these are people that were supposed to be what? Followers of Yehoshua. He didn't write these letters to non-believers. He wrote them to the groups of called out ones that were supposed to be professing a faith in, in Yehoshua and following the word. That's who he's writing to. We have the same thing in our society today among all people. And I think it's something that's been carried over or, or brought over through Christianity you know, and we just kind of cover up things and make out like it never happened and everything's good, right? But it's not. Oh, well, it doesn't matter how bad you are. Unless you confess your sin, you know, you're not going to be forgiven, right? What happens if you have unconfessed sin in your life? You die. Period, right? If you, Unless you confess it, and you're only forgiven if you confess it. Now, I'm not saying that everybody can remember every sin they ever did. <laughs> If we could, we'd be in the pride then. <laughs> Go back. We're going to get on in chapter 23. Did I tell you all this is a short reading today? <clears throat> Verse 1 of, of, of Deuteronomy. 23, he who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation shall not enter the congregation of Yahweh. What it says in the English. <clears throat> We've got to talk about this a little bit because write down the word uh, or the number 6951 which is the number for the word congregation in that verse. 6951. The normal word that's used to, to apply to the congregation or to the assembly or so forth is the word uh, number 4744, which is the word mikra, which means the assembly. But that's a different word than what's used in this passage. In this passage here, this 6951, the word is kahal, like K-A-W-H-A-W-L, kahal. It has a little difference. It's not just an assembly of people. It's people who are assembled to do particular religious work, let's say. And what he's really saying, the way I understand this passage, is that people who have this, men, emasculated by crushing or mutilation, he's talking about someone whose private organs and so forth have been distorted or mutilated or, or something like that. Castration, or even, you know, literally he said, you know, have his members cut off, you know. He can't participate in these things that Yahweh, you know, tells people to do. We see it over in when you're talking about the Levites, and they have to be, you know. But here it's the same thing in this word assembly as those who are assembled for a particular religious purpose, let's say. <clears throat> Go to Leviticus 21. Leviticus 21. In verses uh, 17 through 22. Now this is specifically speaking, of course, to Levites, okay? What we have over here in Deuteronomy, he's not talking about any particular tribe or anything else. He's just talking about anyone, a man who has this problem, right? But now that the, the tribe, uh, the descendants of Aaron are supposed to be set apart for a particular thing. But here in Leviticus 21, in verse 17, it says, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your descendants in 
generations to come, of course, who has any defects may approach to offer the bread of his Elohim, his creator, right? For any man who has a defect shall not approach a, a man blind or lame who has a marred face or any limb too long, a man who has a broken foot or broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or a defect in his eye or eczema or a scab or is a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron, the priest who has a defect, shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to Yahweh. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his Elohim. He may eat the bread of his Elohim, both the most holy and the holy. He's not being kicked out of the clan, is he, or out of the family, or anything else. And yet it's some of the same things that's mentioned here is what we're reading over here in Deuteronomy. So what is the difference? Why is this man told that he can't come into the congregation, which is the English word that's used? Is it really saying he can't be in the congregation, or he can't participate in some of these religious things of the congregation? <clears throat> Go to Isaiah, in chapter 56. If somebody had been castrated, that makes them what we call a eunuch today, right? <laughs> kind of tough subject to talk about, isn't it? In Isaiah chapter 56, starting in verse 3. He said, Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh speak, saying... Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. If they do that, aren't they brought into the assembly of his people or to the family, so to speak? For thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. I remember reading some commentaries on these passages of scriptures that we talk about over here in Deuteronomy. And then they say, well, in the old days, in the Old Testament, if a man had a problem, they just kicked him out of the whole family. They couldn't even be in the congregation. But then Isaiah is a prep. A prophecy of when Messiah comes and all that kind of stuff is going to be done away with and they can all be part of it no matter what. Isn't that a distortion of what the scripture says? Isn't that kind of a, a cover up because nobody really understands? This thing, does this say anything in here about, oh, well, this is just in the last days when Messiah comes? If that's what it meant, don't you think it'd say that? Has anybody realized that Yahweh is not shy about saying what he means? When Messiah was here and those people came out to him, you know, and, and he said, you brood of serpents. I mean, he wasn't shy about telling them a bunch of snakes. <laughs> you say that today in a pulpit and it'd be on you, you know, you know, real quick. But notice in verse 6, also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Isn't it, not, isn't it neat how he associates keeping the Sabbath with his covenant? Because the Sabbath day is a covenant sign itself, not just in the covenant, but it's a sign in the covenant itself. Verse 7, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Yahweh, Elohim, who gathers the outcast of Israel, says, Yet I will gather to him besides those who are gathered to him. So the whole house of Israel is going to be made up of a lot of people from all different nations. And New Testament says, you know, just because you're of the seed of Abraham don't mean you're going to be in the family. <laughs> it's those who do the word of Yahweh. That's what matters. <clears throat> Go back in chapter 23. So in verse 2 he says, One of illegitimate birth shall not enter the congregation of Yahweh. Even to the tenth generation, none of his shall enter the congregation of Yahweh. This word congregation again is the same number, 6951. 
throughout this chapter where this word congregation is used, it's just number 6951. Every place else the word is, is mikra, but not in these in these passages. So one of the illegitimate birth. Now if you look that up, and I didn't write down the number, <laughs> but you'll find that in the, in, in the Strong's it gives you the definition from the Jewish people, it means one who is born of a Hebrew father and a heathen mother. And they call that mixed bastard, right? But the question is, when Joseph was shipped off down to Egypt and he was given an Egyptian woman as a bride, and then we have Ephraim and Manasseh, those two were adopted into his family and made the right of the firstborn. And who's the right of the firstborn belong to? Ephraim. And he had a Hebrew father and a Egyptian mother. So that definition can apply in this passage the way I see it. And then in verse 3, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the congregation of Yahweh even to the tenth generation. None of his shall enter the congregation of Yahweh forever. Now Ammon and Moab were the two sons of Lot by his daughters, right? They were the product of incest. And yet we know of a particular Moabite woman, right? Shall we go to the book of Ruth? I wonder how come this didn't apply to her. You, you realize you can build all kinds of doctrines and teachings and traditions and everything else on one or two verses if we ignore the other verses of Scripture, right? But if you just say, see, that's saying nobody and all of either one of the two tribes can ever come into the children of Israel forever, right? That's what you'd have to say if you base it on this one Scripture. But in the book of Ruth, Ruth is in there somewhere in the, New Te in the Old Testament, right? On page <laughs> Not in mine. But in the book of Ruth in chapter 1, Uh, in verse 8 of chapter 1 Naomi is getting ready to come back to the land of Israel because they're living in Moab you remember when she and her husband and the two sons went down there then the two sons married these Moabite women but in verse 8 Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law go return each to her mother's house and then she'll say Yahweh deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me but she's telling them, you know, you go on back to your family and to your gods and, and whatever it was you had because I'm going back where I came from. <clears throat> Verse 10, they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. Wait a minute. They said we will return with you to your people. And then she goes to a whole bunch of reasons why they shouldn't. In verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. She's saying she kissed her. She's saying goodbye. She's going back to her people, but Ruth wouldn't leave her. Verse 15, and she said, this is Naomi speaking to Ruth, and she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods return after your sister-in-law. And she's saying to Ruth, you go back to your people and your gods, you know, the way, just the same as they did. Going back to it. But she wouldn't go. In verse 16, but Ruth said, Urge me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you, for wherever you go, I will go. What has she decided? Who is she now? She ain't what she used to be. I'm not one of them anymore. I'm with you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people, my people. You'll notice the word shall be is there. It's in italics. It's not in the original text. She didn't say they shall be. She said they is. <laughs> they already is. 
I think it's important to understand the distinction in those, not some future thought that might be, but already is in existence. Your people, my people. Isn't that different from saying your people shall be my people? No, she's saying it already is this way. She's no longer than a Moabite. What is she? She's a Hebrew. She's of the children of Israel. She has crossed over and become part of. Verse 17, where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. Yahweh, do so to me and more also. If we're parted outside of death. That's what she's saying. She's made up her mind who she is. So we have to understand, <coughs> going back to Deuteronomy. It's our choice. Huh? It's our choice. It's our choice, yeah. But when you go back to uh, Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, and Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the congregation of Yahweh even to the tenth generation. None of his shall enter the congregation of Yahweh forever. Because, and then he gives you the reason underlying this. Because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt. And because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Peor of Mesopotamia to curse you. Ruth did not do any of those things. In fact, she became one of them. There's a whole different concept here. She is no longer what she was. Can you imagine thinking about your ancestors and what they did to these people, and then I'm walking away from my ancestors, and I'm becoming part of the people that they've been cursing for all these years? be a tough road, wouldn't it, for her? And yet today, when we come out of the world to accept Yahweh, Aren't we coming out of the ones who killed him? Are we coming out of the ones who rejected him? I mean, who knows what kind of blood we got, you know, going back to who or who we came from or anything else. But if we go back to Noah, don't all of us have the blood, the same blood that ran in the, blood, in the veins of Noah, regardless of anything else? So we all have to change from it. So it's really not a blood thing. It's what you choose to do. It's the choice that we make inside. <clears throat> but this, verse 4, Because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pithor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Mesopotamia, where is that today? Ur of the Chaldees? Iraq, Iran, that's all that area over there. Those people hated and cursed. <clears throat> Go to Second Peter. In chapter 2. In, uh, in this passage of Scripture in chapter 2 where Peter is beginning to talk, in verse 1 of chapter 2 he said, but there were also false prophets among the people. So he's talking about all kinds of people teaching false things. Are there false prophets today? Mm -hmm. Are there people that are teaching false things today? In verse 12 of that chapter, he said, But these, like natural brute beasts, are made to be caught and destroyed. They speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. You know, we think about the people today who are teaching all kinds of things and, and trying to make money and trying to gain profit and trying to do all this kind of stuff at the expense of somebody else. What's the difference between somebody wearing the costume of the clergy and scamming money from people and building big houses and swimming pools and buying cars, what's the difference between that and illegal uh, grafts and corruption? What's the difference? They're gaining it by false premises. Isn't that a scam? Isn't that called a con artist? And yet so many people today think, oh, those people are so godly. 
you know. But in verse 15 it said, They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. They have gone astray. And we read what happened to Balaam. He got killed, right? <laughs> Go to Jude, chapter 1. <laughs> in 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 the book of Jude in verse 3 he said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation or deliverance. He said he was wanting to write to them about our deliverance, right? But he said, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our Creator into licentiousness and deny or contradict the only master, Yehoshua, and our master, Yehoshua the Mashiach. Aren't there people out there today contradicting him? Did not the Messiah say, don't even think that I came to abolish the law? I didn't. Did he say that? And yet we have a whole congregation, a uh, uh, whole congregation, we have a whole nation of so-called Christianity teaching that he what? Did away with the law. And he said he didn't. Somebody lying, and I don't think it's the one that we're looking to for our salvation. And notice here in this verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run eat greedily in the era of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Did anybody ever thought about that, going in the way of Cain? Cain slew Abel, right? Abel was more righteous than Cain, right? Cain brought a sacrifice from what? From his fruits of the ground, from what I raised. I brought mine. What did Abel bring? He brought an animal from the flock, the blood. And yet, with this, without the shedding of blood, there is no what? No remission of sin. Abel then did what he was supposed to do. Cain did what I think is right. They have what? Gone in the way of Cain? Do you see a whole world of organized religious people out there today doing what they think is right in their own eyes? I mean, how many times do you talk to somebody about, you know, Christmas celebration? And you say, Yahweh said we're not supposed to worship him in that way. Well, I know it's pagan, but I don't do it for that reason. Who cares what your reason is? You're still doing it for yourself because he said don't do it, right? Did he ever tell us to celebrate in these pagan ways? No, he said don't do it, didn't he? So if you're doing that and then saying, well, I don't do it for that reason, isn't that exactly what this is saying right here in Jude? They have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit. You realize our society in the United States of America, we have, what, two or three days out of the whole year, which is the number one days for profit in this country, right? In Christmas, one of them. If you start coming against Christmas, don't you, you know, hitting somebody in the pocketbook and nearly everybody in the country, and then you start trying to talk to them about Easter or Halloween or anything else, and you're hitting them in the book, in the pocketbook. They ain't going to like it when you mess with their money. But that's what happened. And then go to Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> You know, if nothing else, anybody who has a Bible can tell you where Genesis and Revelation are. <laughs> they don't have to hunt for them, do they? Nah. Revelation 2. He's writing to a, to a group of people in a place called Pergamos, which is up in Turkey today. In verse 14, he said, But I have a few things against you. 
because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. He's saying these who hold the doctrines of Balaam. Balaam was hired to curse the children of Israel, remember? But he couldn't do it. And Yahweh kept changing it, made a blessing out of it. But he kept trying. And finally when he figured out, I can't curse them, what did he do? He told them, well, this is what you do to cause the children then to curse themselves. If nobody else can put a curse on us, then how can we put a curse on ourselves? By disobeying His Word. And that's simple. I set before you this day life and blessing, death and curses you choose. And the next week we're going to get into Deuteronomy 28. That's a pretty short chapter. Uh -huh. Now, 15 verses of blessings and, and 4,000 of curses. But, you know, a few more. <clears throat> Go back to Deuteronomy. In verse 5 he said, Nevertheless, Yahweh Eloheka would not listen to Balaam, but Yahweh Eloheka turned the curse into a blessing for you because Yahweh Eloheka loves you. You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. Who? The Ammonites and the Moabites. You shall not seek their peace. Isn't that the same thing as saying don't pray for them? Well, we can't imagine us not praying for somebody, could we? And yet Yahweh is saying, don't even seek their peace, right? Isn't that the same thing as saying that? You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. Who is Edom? Esau. 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 <laughs> you shall not abhor an Egyptian, because you were an alien in his land. The children of the third generation born to them may enter the congregation of Yahweh. See, that's the number 6951. Those children of the third generation may enter the congregation. I'm thinking about this because in 135 A.D. there was a man who was a chief rabbi of Israel whose name was Akiba, and his family were proselytized to Judaism. He was not born among the natural tribes, and yet he became the chief rabbi of the nation of Israel. So we then have applications, you know, in history and on what we know of what the Scripture says is what I'm trying to get to. In verse 9, he says, When the army goes out against your enemies, then keep yourself from every wicked thing. When the army goes out. If there is any man among you who becomes unclean by some occurrence in the night, then he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come inside the camp. If somebody is in an army and he kills somebody in hand-to-hand -hand combat and he you know, killed him and he's touching him, he's becoming unclean, right? So anything can happen. You know, back then they didn't have, you know, long-range laser-guided missiles. They had arrows on bows, you know, that are guided with your eyeball or swords. In verse 11, But it shall be when evening comes that he shall wash with water, and when the sun sets he may come into the camp. He washes it with water, and when the sun sets, that's the new day beginning, right? When we understand the day begins at sundown, then you wash, and you know, you're unclean until evening, then in evening the new day begins, and then everything starts over. Verse 12, also you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go out, and you shall have an implement among your equipment, and when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuge. He's saying if you go outside the camp with a shovel, <laughs> and don't do it, and then leave it laying around. Isn't that what he's saying? But people leave stuff laying around all the time. You know, all, you know. But in verse 14, For Yahweh Alaheka walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you. i got a question. Is he walking in the midst of our camp now? And remember this referring to the camp. It's not just referring to us here in this house right now. He's talking about where we live. Right? Yahweh walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. No, that's a day-to-day -day thing. That's not just one time when the enemy comes against you. Is the enemy out there after us every day? Is that the adversary? Well, the Yahweh walks in our camp to deliver us on a daily basis, right? Is he expecting to see things clean? Notice what it says. 
to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. Therefore your camp shall be holy or set apart that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. Are there specific things that could be unclean or anything? Anything can be unclean, right? You can make something unclean. I'm just saying that this is not just referring to what you're supposed to cover up with a shovel. <laughs> okay? No unclean thing should be in the midst of the camp. Verse 15. You shall not give back to his master the slave who has escaped from his master to you. You know, we only have one passage in the scripture that talks about uh, a slave leaving his master, and that's the book of Philemon. And then Paul writes to him, you know, and he said, I'm going to send him back, but I want you to receive him back as a brother, not as a slave. Big difference. In verse 16, He may dwell with you in your midst in the place which he chooses within one of your gates where it seems best to him. You shall not oppress him. There shall be no harlot of the daughters of Israel or a perverted one of the sons of Israel. Perverted one, that's referring to a male prostitute type. <clears throat> Verse 18, You shall not bring the hire of a harlot or the price of a dog to the house of Yahweh Eloheka for any vowed offering, for both of these are an abomination to Yahweh Eloheka. I remember here some time back there was a bunch of women in a, in a house of prostitution somewhere that had a bunch of money and they wanted to give it to some place and they, you know, they tried to give it to the churches and churches were saying no, they wouldn't take it because of where it came from and what it was. And yet there was another church called them up and said, hey, we'll take it. Because after all, you know, we're in a new covenant. Do you think money from prostitution or money from other any illicit purpose would be acceptable to Yahweh if you gave it to Him? If we begin to understand the purity that He demands out of each one of us, okay, then we can understand if He doesn't even want to see anything unclean, He sure wouldn't accept something. <clears throat> Verse 19, You shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest. If anybody ever borrowed money from the bank to buy a house, or do we pay interest on it? Mm -hmm. Then them people don't consider us brothers, do they? <laughs> and yet sometimes when we loan people money, we expect to get it back with interest, don't we? Even a brother sometimes. You know, the, it's one thing to read these things, and it's another thing to try to apply them in our life and make them work. And sometimes that's the... That, that, you know, it's hard. I'm not trying to say all these things are easy. We all know better than that. But we have to make the attempt. And if you don't even make the attempt, then why study it in the first place? <clears throat> in verse 20, it says, To a foreigner you may charge interest, but to your brother you shall not charge interest, that Yahweh Eloheka may bless you in, in all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. <clears throat> if you don't charge interest, who's going to bless you? Yeah. Yahweh yeah. will. If you lend to a brother and not expect it back, then the scripture says that Yahweh will pay it back with interest. But you lend to a brother, you don't expect to get it back, right? <clears throat> but how many people? I mean, a lot of people out there have such a love for money, they just can't, you know, their love for that money has got them just, you know, whatever it is, that you know, most important thing in their life. In verse 21, if anybody ever made a vow, when you make a vow to Yahweh your El, you shall not delay to pay it. For Yahweh your Elohim will surely require it of you and it would be sin to you. If we make a vow to Yahweh and don't pay it, should we do what we said? <laughs> and if you don't, then it's sin. Anybody ever thought about it? We know that breaking his word is sin, right? But at the same time, he's saying, if you make a vow with your mouth, if you commit yourself with your mouth, right, what happens then if you try to go back on that commitment you made with your mouth? Now, I'm not talking about making vows to somebody else. I'm talking about making a vow to Yahweh. Let's keep in perspective what, what we're saying, what we're reading here. To Yahweh. 
And if you break that vow, then he will not hold you guiltless, right? Does that mean that you can't be forgiven of it? No, you can be forgiven. But you sure better not ever do it again. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. That's one of them other little books that's so hard to find. In verse 4 and 5 of Ecclesiastes. It's on page 753 in my Bible. 956 in this one. Oh, okay. In verse 4, When you make a vow to El, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Have you ever thought about that? When you make a vow and then you don't do what you said, he's saying that he has no pleasure in fools. Is he calling us a fool if we don't keep a vow? Mm -hmm. Pay what you have vowed. It is better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Is that not saying that when you make a commitment with your mouth, you honor it? If you can't keep your word, don't give it. We expect him to keep his word to us, don't we? And if we're going to walk in his footsteps, and if we give our word to him or to somebody else, we keep what we say, right? But now you're back down to making a difference who you're talking to. If you give him your word, you do it even to your own hurt. Doesn't Scripture say that? Even to your own hurt. You don't go trying to find loopholes or ways out. You just do what you said. It may cost you something, but it'll also teach you don't do it again. Right? <clears throat> okay. Go back to Deuteronomy. In verse 22, he said, But if you abstain from bowing, it shall not be sin to you. Have we ever heard people on television preaching or anything else and, and trying to get you to come make a vow to somebody or, or vow this or vow that? Oh, well, Yahweh will honor it. <laughs> In verse 23, he said, That which is gone from your lips you shall keep and perform, perform for you voluntarily vowed to Yahweh, your El, what you have promised with your mouth. You opened your mouth and promised. You volunteered it. In the multitude of words, there is much sin. There's a lot of people talk a whole lot of time when they shouldn't be saying that. I'll just keep their mouth shut and listen. But when you make a vow, you better do it. Verse 24. <laughs> When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes at your pleasure, but you shall not put any in your container. If you go in there and fill up a container for them, you're stealing from them, right? But if you just go through there and eat what, you know, put your mouth and eat them, that's different. I mean, right? No. It's there for everybody's use. Gleaning, taking the leftovers in the fields, the grapes, the fruit, whatever is there, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking one off and eating it. He says so. Verse 25, When you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. You can walk through the field and eat with your hand full, but you don't take a sickle and cut the sheaves and bind them and take them with you. <laughs> That's stealing. But you know, people don't think about that. But does this Torah say that you can walk through the field and eat with your hands, right? Go to Luke chapter 6. <laughs> this is an excellent, I think, example of how Jewish tradition had put... Um, <clears throat> different interpretation on what Torah said and then they were trying to enforce their interpretation of the scriptures not the scripture itself <clears throat> and yet today people still don't know how to go back and, and refute what this says because they don't know what scriptures say in Luke chapter 6 and verse 1 And I'm kind of wondering here what it means when he said, now it happened on the second Sabbath. Second Sabbath, what does that mean? Second Sabbath from what? I mean, had anybody ever thought about that second Sabbath? 
if you <laughs> if you have festivals and so forth, in the first day, the seven days is a Sabbath, and then the second, you know, the last day could be a Sabbath. Could be counting of the Omer, couldn't it? On the second Sabbath from the counting of the Omer, maybe? Could be, okay. But on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? They had taken something which Yahweh had said you could do, and now they had made it a rule that you can't do that on the Sabbath because they said plucking the heads of grain is like plowing or reaping, right? It's some kind of work, and they're trying to say, well, you can't do that because that's work, and that's not what Yahweh said. We take the things that what Yahweh says sometimes, and we add to or switch them around to what we think or what we fail and try to put those things on somebody else. We all have done that oh, in, in, you know, in time past, but we grow, okay? And we have to change. We have to be able to recognize sometimes that what I thought or what I said may not necessarily be what the Scripture actually says or means, especially if we're trying to build something on New Testament, which is nothing but commentary on the Old anyway. <laughs> There's a whole lot of what they wrote. How many different Greek texts do we have in the New Testament? Nearly 9,000. And they're all different. So which one's the inspired one? I mean, who knows, right? So the only thing that we can really verify truth with is to go back to what the Torah says, because all the Hebrew texts say the same thing. Okay. Go back over there, Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Chapter 24. Y'all see how fast we're moving here? Hmm. when a man takes a wife and marries her and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her and he writes her a certificate of divorce puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house <clears throat> we got to look at that word uncleanness the number is 6172 Erva is the Hebrew word, erva, like E-R-V-A-W. The figurative meaning of the word is a disgrace or a blemish. It's really not talking about unclean, because you can watch something that's unclean. But we're talking about here a disgrace or a blemish. Now this is kind of a touchy little, little subject, but a lot of the tribes in Africa they take and, and they do with women what they would call a circumcision of women, which really is, is just a mutilation anyway. But they do this thing so that men would not want that woman anymore. And this is really more or less what this is talking about, what it's referring to. When you have found a disgrace or a blemish, okay, and you find no favor, then you know, he writes her a certificate of divorce. Now in verse 2 it says, When she had departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before Yahweh, and you shall not bring sin on the land which Yahweh Eloheka is giving you as an inheritance. It's all talking about bringing sin on the land. If a woman is married to a man and he divorces her, then she goes and marries somebody else, and then the other one wants to, you know, she come back, the first one can't take her back. Yahweh, when he betrothed Israel to himself on the mountain, gave her the ketubah, right? How to live. Did she ever go and get married to somebody else? Yeah, she followed all kinds of harlots and all this kind of stuff, went after other gods and all this kind of stuff. Well, then in reality, then he can't take her back, can he? If, he? if he follows his own Torah. And the only way that he can take her back is something must happen so that that woman becomes a new creature again. Right? So through the Passover cup, when he offers the cup of the Passover, he says, this is a new disposition you know, in my blood. What happened? The minute she accepted that, she became a new creature in him and can be married to him again. But he ain't going to be married to the old. 
The old one's got to change, right? Because the old one's covered with sin and uncleanness and all kinds of stuff. So the Passover also is a way then of us becoming a new creature, being purified in his eyes so that we can be what? Presented to him. You're dead to the old, but you're married you know, into the new. I'm saying this is an application, not the only interpretation, okay? When we look at these things. <clears throat> Verse 5. When a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year and bring happiness to his wife whom he has taken. No man shall take the lower or the upper millstone in pledge, for he takes one living or life in pledge. People don't realize if you got a millstone out there, one of them is a big flat stone laid out on the ground. It's got a little groove in it, you know, with a lip on it, and then it's got another stone with a hole in it that sets up on top. You stick a pole through it and hook it in the middle, and you kind of roll it around and around, and then you throw grain in there, and it just thing goes right and grinds your grain. You take away that, then what has he got in the way to, to make his, his grain or, or to make his life? Is what he's talking about. Verse 7 If a man is found kidnapping, Literally in Hebrew it says, stealing any of his brethren or the children of Israel. See, it applies kidnapping to be the same as stealing. And no thief shall ever what, inherit in the kingdom of heaven. If a man is found stealing or kidnapping any of his brethren or the children of Israel and mistreats him or sells him, then that kidnapper shall die. What do we do today if somebody who kidnaps a child? Do we kill him? No. <coughs> find something, you know, some other way, something, you know. Then that kidnapper shall die and you shall put away the evil from among you. Not Again, not the person, but the evil itself. Then in verse 8, take heed in the outbreak of leprosy that you diligently observe and do according to all that the priest, the Levite, shall teach you just as I commanded them so you shall be careful to do. All the instructions concerning leprosy and what to do in the, in the purification, the cleansing of someone with leprosy was all done through what? Through the Levitical priesthood. But notice in verse 9, remember what Yahweh Eloheka did to Miriam on the way when you came out of Egypt. What did he do to Miriam? He struck her with leprosy. Why? Because she badmouthed Moses. <laughs> Actually, her and Aaron were doing it. And then Yahweh brought him out and he struck her with leprosy. And then what they did is they put her out of the camp for a week. And then when Moses prayed for her to heal her, he said, well, you know, if, if her father had just spit on her, she'd still be out of camp for a week. And a whole congregation, two million people sat there and waited for her to get over the leprosy and get clean and come back in before they could move again. But do you think that Yahweh thought it was important that people should learn not to blaspheme against Moses? <clears throat> In seminaries today, now I'll bring this up because I just, I've been doing some study and reading concerning some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and so forth and some of the things that are coming out of the teachings. And you know, it's, it's 50 years since the... the the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we still don't see much published in them. And I think the main reason for it is because they're really not discovering anything new. What they are discovering, a lot of things would verify what we already had. If there had been something new that went against it, well, they'd have published it, you know, and made it big time. But a lot of the, the scholars who are involved with the last 40 or 50 years of the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls have found today in seminaries Students are not learning what the Bible says. They're learning theories about how the Bible was put together. Oh, well, J, you know, wrote these and put these together, or W did it, and these theories are assigned these different letters representing a different person who did it. J, by the way, is supposed to represent a woman who lived during the time of Corinthians, and she was the one that wrote and put together the, the Old Testament, you know, the Torah. Isn't that marvelous? I mean... We all thought, you know, that Moses did it because that's what Yahweh and Messiah said, but, you know. But they're going to seminaries. They're not learning what the Word says. They're learning the theories concerning the assembling of the words of the Bible, you know, in these theories. 
And then when they come out of seminaries, they get ordained and they get their, their license or they get a job in a church somewhere and they don't have time to teach people what the Bible says if they even knew. Why not? Because they're too busy trying to establish and build and meet the budget because we got to have the budget, you know, because we got to build a new wing on the whatever. They, they're all involved in all this money. They don't have time to teach truth. Too busy doing other things. And after all, we got to bring in more young people. So what are we going to do to bring in the young people? we got to build some programs to get them in, you know? Whatever people do. What I'm trying to get back to... <clears throat> verse 9, Remember what Yahweh al did to, to, to Miriam <laughs> on the way when you came out of Egypt. Most of the things that are coming out of organized religion goes against what Moses said. We have a group out of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary right now, you know, that's coming together saying that the words that Messiah is written and had to have said, he didn't really say any of those. It was his mother who wrote them. It was his mother who said them. Is that not a blasphemy against him? Why would people do that? Can you imagine anybody who understands the importance that Yahweh applies on His Word because He is faithful to perform it? So I think He would you know, look very unfavorably on somebody who would go back and say, well, that's really not true, or He didn't say that, or, or whatever, right? I mean, He died. The Messiah Hosea came to die according to what this Word says. Do you think He considers that important? Verse 10. When you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house to get his pledge. I wonder why it says that. If you lend somebody something and they give you something as a pledge or what we would call collateral, you know, and you're going to hold it, right? You don't go into his house and get it because after all, you're just lending him money and that's collateral. You don't own the person. But people so many times when they loan something to somebody, they want to control everything about it because I own you now is what their thought is. Have you ever thought about that? That's what they think. <clears throat> Verse 11, You shall stand outside, and the man to whom you lend shall bring the pledge out to you. And if the man is poor, you shall not sleep with or keep his pledge overnight. You shall in any case return the pledge to him again when the sun goes down that he may sleep in his own garment and bless you. You realize what the pledge is? It's his garment. <laughs> it's not anything else. What did people have? What did they own? Only the clothes on their back. And it shall be righteousness to you before Yahweh Eloheka. What shall be righteousness? returning the pledge to him before dark. The obedience, Yahweh said return it to him before dark, right? When you do that, then you are what? It shall be righteousness to you. The act of obedience to Yahweh's word is righteousness to you. That's a clear example of what righteousness is, I think. Obeying what Yahweh said. <clears throat> In verse 14, You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates, you don't oppress or beat down a hired servant. You don't oppress a hired servant, whether it's a brother or somebody else. The treatment of people is supposed to be the same if they're working, you know, serving you, no matter what who they are. Our actions towards somebody are not predicated on what they do. Our actions towards somebody is predicated on what Yahweh says they're supposed to be in regard to that person. If you change how or, or how you react or what you do because of what somebody else does or doesn't do, then you're letting that person dictate what you do and who you are. If our actions are based on what Yahweh says, it doesn't matter what that person thinks or says or does. We're still reacting in that situation according to what he said, not what they did. So the other person really has no what? No bearing on the equation. It's strictly between you and Yahweh. Between us and Him. That's what we do. Verse 12, If the man is poor, you shall not keep his pledge overnight. 
you shall in any case return the pledge to him again when the sun goes down that he may sleep in his own garment and bless you and it shall be righteousness to you before or in the presence of Yahweh Eloheka. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates. Each day you shall give him his wages and not let the sun go down on it, for he is poor and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to Yahweh and it be sin to you. We would never think about that mistreatment of somebody as being sin. And our, our whole society is based on treating people, you know, some other way. <laughs> Verse 16, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children, nor shall the children be put to death for the fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. A father cannot be put to death for the sin of a child, right? You can't take his place. child can't take your place. Each one dies for his own sin. Is this not what that's saying? We think we can help somebody. We think we can save somebody. We think we can do this, but we can't. And I know everybody likes to say, well, my children are never going to wind up going to hell. They're going to go to heaven with us, right? But that's their choice, not yours. And out of the millions of people that are going to be destroyed, somebody's brother, somebody's sister, somebody's mother, somebody's child, it can't be any other way. The reality is not necessarily nice, but it's true. It doesn't make any difference what we think about or how much we want to make it seem pleasant or something else, it's still true. <coughs> somebody's going to die. It's somebody's mother, brother, sister, father, something. Verse 17, You shall not pervert justice due the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. A widow, can you imagine a widow who has no means of support? You know, if, if she's a widow, her husband died. Most widows were taken care of what? When they would go to the temple, would be fed, you know, out of whatever they have. And what is pure religion? To take care of what? The widows? The orphans? This type of thing? That's what he says is pure religion. Verse 18, But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and Yahweh Eloheka redeemed you from there. Therefore I command you to do this thing. Have y'all noticed all the things that we've been reading up here is talking about day-to-day -day things on how to get along and deal with people? What's good and what's bad? And how to, how to react in those situations. There's things we live with every day. And yet what really dictates what we do in our life? The rules of the world. The rules of the society that we live in. Most of the time we're trying to think about what society says and not what the scripture says. Isn't that what we're normally thinking about? Verse 19. <clears throat> when you reap your harvest in your feet. Well, wait a minute. Before we go to 19. <laughs> go, to, go to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. The name Ezekiel in the Hebrew actually is Yehezkel, or Yehezkiel. El meaning, you know, Yahweh the Elohim, the Creator. And Yehezkel actually means Yahweh strengthens. Yahweh will strengthen you. But here in, in chapter 18, Ezekiel or Yehezkel says, The word of Yahweh came to me again, saying, have you ever thought about the word of Yahweh came to me saying, who is the word, Yehoshua? Is it Yehoshua that came to him and spoke? Or did the word just float around in the air, you know, like Casper, the friendly ghost? What did he see? Did the word just apply a picture? Or did Yehoshua, the word himself, appear to him? I, you know, this is what we're trying to... Okay. The word of Yahweh came to me again saying, what do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Have you ever thought about that? The fathers eat the sour grapes and what they do causes the children to have certain things. It's the same thing as saying if the father sinned, then the child pays the price. 
And that's not true. Verse 3, as I live, says Yahweh Elohim, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. But if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, if he has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted up his eyes to the items of the house of Israel, to eat on the mountains is referring to what? Go to these pagan places of worship, these pagan shrines and everything which are built on every high hill and under, under, under every green tree. Nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman during her impurity. Sounds to me like he's talking about all those who have followed the Torah. If he has not oppressed anyone, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, has robbed no one by violence, has given his bread to the hungry, covered the nakedness with clothing, if he has not exacted usury or lent money at interest, nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity. Withdraw your hand from iniquity. It means don't get involved in any kind of sin. And executed true justice or judgment between man and man. If he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgment faithfully, he is just, he shall surely live, says Yahweh Elohim. Verse 10, if he begets a son who is a robber or a shedder of blood who does any, or who does any of these things and does none of those duties is implied, none of the things you're supposed to do, but has eaten on the mountains, gone into all them pagan places, defiled his neighbor's wife, if he has oppressed the poor and the needy, robbed by violence, not restored the pledge, lifted his eyes to the idols, or committed abomination. If he has exacted usury, or taken interest, or taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live if he has done any of these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. If, however, he begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done, and considers but does not do likewise. You see the sins that your father did, but you don't do that. You live according to what Yahweh's word says. Boy, that's tough. You realize that when you realize all the things that Yahweh says you're supposed to do, and then you look and you see your father never did them, what does that say to you? It said he died. And if he never repented and turned back in obedience to Yahweh, where is he? Those are questions we can't answer. We don't know. We can't see into his heart. Only Yahweh can. That's why you can't apply what we think to somebody who's already gone on. You don't know where they are. <clears throat> Verse 18, As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother by violence, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity or his sin. Yet you say, Why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the Son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and done them, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father bear the guilt of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Verse 23. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Says Yahweh Elohim. Or Elohim. And not that he should turn from his ways and live. He said he had no pleasure in the death of those. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abomination that the wicked does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them he shall die. You turn away from walking a straight path and you commit iniquity and everything else you ever did good is just forgotten. And what happens then? You're going to die. The question everybody has to understand when you're dealing with the people of the world, do they believe what this word says? Do they know what this word says? You talk to the people who are in organized religion, they think they're doing right. They don't have any idea what the definition of sin is, even though it's in 1 John. 
Verse 25, yet you say the way of Yahweh is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair and your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked one turns away from the wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive. When he turns away from the iniquity, iniquity that's Shuvah. When he turns back in obedience to Yahweh's word, right? Verse 28, because he considers and turns away from all the transgression which he committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Is that not a great promise? As long as we're still alive and we can repent and turn back, we got hope. Verse 29, yet the house of Israel says, the way of Yahweh is not fair. O house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says Yahweh Elohim. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. <clears throat> Verse 31, cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit for why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says Yahweh Elohim. Therefore turn and live. The scripture someplace tells us that Yahweh is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of repentance. To the knowledge of turning back in obedience to the Torah. That's what Yahweh wishes for everybody. Go to Matthew chapter 3. In verse 1 and 2. Now this is Yochanan, John the Mercer, John the Baptist, you know, who's preaching. And notice it says, In those days John, or Yochanan the Baptist, came preaching in the woods of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did you say 23? Matthew 3, Three. Oh. 1 and 2. Sorry. Yeah, Matthew 23 says a whole lot different in 1 and 2 than it does here in, in Matthew. <laughs> in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here in a minute, when we get into this other thing I want to show, we're going to talk about what Messiah said. But John came saying, Repent. Messiah came saying, Repent. All the prophets that he ever sent down to get those people that turned away, he kept saying, Repent. Well, if you repent and turn back, turn back to what? How come people can't see that? I mean, it's so in my mind, it's just it's so clear. You know, you repent and turn back to what? You don't return back to something that's done away with, do you? Kind of hard to do. Go back to Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Now we're going to go on verse 19. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. Have you ever thought about that? When you're reaping in your field and you forget a sheaf. Oh, I messed that one. And you go back. To, no, he said, you don't go back and get it. You leave it. You know what that would teach you real quick? <clears throat> Pay attention to what you're doing the first time. Right? <laughs> It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow that Yahweh Elohecha may bless you in all the work of your hands. You ever thought of it? He's saying after you got what you're supposed to do and leave it, there's somebody going to come behind you and get what you left. Boaz did that, right? And he even told some of the young men working for him, drop some extra on purpose. For Ruth, right? <coughs> in Proverbs, Yahweh says when your ways please him, he can make even your enemies to be at peace with you, right? Think how much he can do for people that like you. You know, how much he can, you know, work for you through them. In verse 20, when you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Leave some up there, whatever left is for them. 
How many times do we leave something for somebody else or do we covet everything for ourselves? We don't want nothing left for somebody else. After all, they can get their own, right? Verse 21, When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. Now, why would he associate remembering you were a slave in the land of Egypt? If you were a slave in the land of Egypt, you would be out there gathering stuff up for your master, right? And how much would you get for yourself? Or how much would belong to you? Or did he leave anything for you? Or did he take everything that you had? You're a slave. You work for him, right? Nothing belongs to you. So he's saying to these people, when you get to be where you're the chief, right? You leave something for somebody else. You don't do what they did to you. Because if you do, then aren't you exacting vengeance on them? And yet Yahweh says, vengeance is mine, saith Yahweh. I don't think we've ever really thought about it. If we're out there, you know, a slave, and you're out there gathering in that stuff, you're not going to do it for yourself, you're gathering for them. Chapter 25. <clears throat> If there is a dispute between men and they come to court, <clears throat> I've changed this in my Bible to match what the Hebrew actually says, and I forget now exactly what it says in the English, but I think it says if there is a dispute between men and they come to court, <clears throat> they go to the judge who may judge them, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Something like that, right? The Hebrew actually said the word court is the number 4941. It's the word mishpat or a verdict. And then the other part where it talks about going to the judge, that phrase in the Hebrew there actually says is or has been pronounced upon them. So it actually what it really says, if there is a dispute between men and they come to the verdict that has been pronounced, which may judge them, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. It's kind of like you've come and, and, and everything's already been settled. Then it shall be, if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, that the judge will cause him to lie down. You see, this is all I'm talking about now. If they come to the verdict, it's already been established. Okay? I'm not talking about going to judges. It's going to what has already been established. And you go where to get that? From the Levites, the priest. And this is the verdict written in Torah established in your case. And they want, you're right and you're wrong. You know, as simple as that. It shall be if the wicked man deserves to be beaten that the judge will cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence according to his guilt with a certain number of blows. Forty blows he may give him and no more lest he should exceed this and beat him with many blows above these and your brother be humiliated in your sight. You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. We all know from the New Testament scriptures on that that if an ox, you know, is eating and it treads out the grain by, you know, the grain is for somebody else, right? But he eats from it himself. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger <coughs> outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. I'm going to say this, and some people are going to probably get real upset when I do, but. And I know that we're talking about somebody outside of the nation of Israel, you know, and not supposed to, 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 to marry somebody because they lift up or raise up a family to the brother's name, right? But at the same time, if you're married to a brother within the family of Israel now, and that one dies, okay, should you marry somebody who is outside of the family, a non believer? Can we see how that applies there as well as to the others, what I'm trying to say? So even if you meet somebody, if he's not a believer, you know, and today we can't exactly say if the brother is, because so many times we don't know who the brother is or blood kin or nothing else, okay? But still, you can't be married to somebody who's not part of Yahweh's family. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> And I'm not saying that you can go, you know, just get divorced for any reason. We're talking about it, death and this type of thing. This is what we're talking about. Verse 6, And it shall be, the firstborn son which she buried will succeed to the name of his dead brother that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So if the brother comes in and raises up children, it's to restore the inheritance 
to that son by the name of what has been given to him. In verse 7, But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him, and if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, Sure shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. You see, the kinsman redeemer is the one who removes his sandal willingly and assumes the responsibility for that. But the one who doesn't has his sandal removed and spit in his face, and he becomes unclean, right? And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal removed. If two men fight together and the wife of one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of the one attacking him and puts out her hand and seizes him by the genital. That means a woman not supposed to be getting involved in this kind of thing, right? That's what it says. Then you shall cut off her hand. Your eyes shall not have pity on her. Pretty strong. You shall not have in your bag different weights. The heavy and the light. I don't know if most people understand what that means, but if you're trying to weigh out something and you're going to buy something from somebody, you know, and I want to give you a good price, but then I use a heavy weight, but if I want to cheat this one, you know, or heavier light or whatever, you know, but it's a way of cheating people is what it all amounts to. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which Yahweh Elohim is giving you. For all who do such things and all who behave unrighteously are an abomination to Yahweh Elohim. Now, wait a minute. All who behave unrighteously are an abomination. Isn't that the same thing as saying all those who turn away from an ear from hearing the Torah, even their prayers are an abomination. What well, it says in Proverbs 28, right? Also what it says to God from John when, when the man said, we know Yahweh don't hear sinners. Here it is in Torah. Verse 17, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and he did not fear. Elohim. Therefore it shall be when Yahweh Elohim has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which Yahweh Elohim is giving you to possess as an inheritance that you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven you shall not forget. Do you think the children of Israel are at rest in the land rest from all their enemies all around them right now? Because if they're not, then this still, in the future, this still comes to pass, is it not? And if you stop and think about something, if we associate with Israel, right, then we're going to be lumped in with them. And if people hate them, they're going to hate you. <clears throat> well, that concludes the reading for this day in the Torah. And in keeping with Shabbat Shabbat, go with me, if you will, to, to Hosea, chapter 14. That's the first book after Daniel. Remember the name Hosea, the number is 1954, and it means deliverer. <laughs> Starting in verse 1. I think I said earlier verse 2, but we're going to start in, in verse 1 anyway. He said, Israel, return to Yahweh Eloheka, your El, your Creator. If we all recognize that the word Elohim, you know, or El, you know, God or Elohim means Creator, then every time he says Yahweh, your Creator, we ought to get to the point sometime where we understand who created it. In Hosea 14 and verse 1, Israel, return to Yahweh Elohim, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. 
Verse 2, he says, take words with you and return to Yahweh. What kind of words are you going to take with you? Words of what? Repentance. Confessing your sin and turning back in obedience to Yahweh. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Now literally, the Hebrew says, we will offer the bull calves of our lips. But what does that mean? What was a bull calf? It was a sacrificial offering. So again, to say we will offer the bull calves of our lips would be like an idiomatic expression referring to sacrifices we make with our mouth. And then you say, Assyria shall not save us. Does that mean that we recognize that that country can't deliver us? We will not ride on horses. We're not going to go try to do our own deliverance anymore. Nor will we say anymore to the work of our hands, you are our gods. Can you imagine somebody making something and standing up and looking at it and saying, you're my God? You know when they set up a stone pillar and begin to worship that idol that was carved out of that stone? I thought about that guy that was teaching, you know, and he said our great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was a rock. In a lot of ways, that's what they're doing, whether they realize it or not, in evolution. They're saying that our grandfather, they're worshiping the stone, the rock. For in you the fathers find mercy. Then he says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. In Israel, it's, it rains at certain times of the year. And in between those times, they don't have rain. You know how bad it's been here this, this year if we don't have much rain, okay? But what if we'd had some dew every morning that was so heavy that it would water the grass? But we don't even have that, do we? But this dew is like the dew to Israel. The dew is what keeps them going between showers, between these rains and so forth. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. There's another place in Scripture where it says the word of Yahweh through Moses shall be like dew on the earth. The dew, the word of Yahweh on a weekly, daily basis is what keeps us going all the time. Can you imagine what would happen right now if all of a sudden somebody said to you for the next six months or a year you ain't going to get no words of Yahweh? Now that sounds pretty hard. Some people say, well, so what? You know, they don't care about it anyway. Verse 6, his branches shall spread, his beauty shall be like an olive tree, and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived as grain. You know, yeah, we, we all have to know, you go out there and look sometimes at things that you've planted and how they're badly wilted, and yet when you get some water, well, then they perk up and come back to life and everything. And you can look out on the grass and everything, it's all brown and, and dying, and then all of a sudden one little shower comes along and it turns green again. They shall be revived as the grain. They shall grow like the vine. Their scent or their remembrance will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? I have heard and observed him. I'm like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of Yahweh are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Even when they think they're doing something that's right, even when they think they're doing what they're supposed to do, they're stumbling all over the place and falling out and falling out of paper. Because they're trying not to. And a lot of times they do the, the right thing, but for the wrong reasons. A lot of times they do the things that Yahweh says, but it's a farce because I'm trying to earn or make money or do something else. I'm just using them for my own gain, not to help him or anybody else. Has anybody not recognized there's a whole lot of people out there trying to follow the ways of Yahweh for their own personal gain, not because of what Yahweh said? All of this has been talking about return to Yahweh. Take words and come back, repent, and turn back to Him. Turn back in obedience to what? The Torah. Go with me to Galatians chapter 3. <laughs> you know, have you ever noticed sometimes when you're trying to talk to people, and the first thing they'll look at you and say, Well, have you read the book of Galatians? 
And I want to say, yeah, I have, did you? <laughs> but you can't do that, can you? Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And if you are the Mashiach, if you belong to Him, if you accept Him, if you are His, right? Then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. Heirs of what? Now I'm just trying to make, I'm sure everybody here really understand, but I'm trying to help you know you to get a hold of this so that you can lay it out to somebody else because this is something they've never seen. And a lot of times somebody's going to look at you and say, have you read the book of Galatians? And hopefully you can say, yeah, have you? Let's go over and look at this one. And what does that mean? Heirs according to the promise. What is the promise that we're an heir of? Well, that, and they've accepted Messiah, host, but we have too. They may not know his name yet, but they, well, we accept him. Well, then what belongs to you if you really accept him? What is it? Go back to Genesis 17. All the way to that first book in the, in the Bible. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 17. Now remember, we just got through reading in Galatians 3.29 that says we are heirs according to the promise. So whatever the promise is that Yahweh made to Abraham is what belongs to us if we are heirs, right? Okay. In Genesis 17, verses 5 through 8. Now this is where he told Abram, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. You see, the name Abram means the father of a nation. But Abraham means the father of many nations. Verse 6, he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants. So he's establishing his covenant with who? The descendants of Abraham. Right? Now, Galatians 3 said, if you are Abraham's seed or descendants, then you are heirs according to the promise. And he's saying, I'm going to what? Establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be Yahweh to you and your descendants after you, or Elohim to you. So the promise that he made to Abraham is that he's going to give his covenant to Abraham and to his descendants, right? Verse 8, Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their Elohim. So he's promising Abraham that he's going to give him the land and the covenant. And he's also going to give the covenant and the land to his descendants. So if we go back to Galatians 3.29, if we are heirs according to the promise, then what belongs to us? The covenant and the land. What covenant? That's the question, right? What covenant? Now go back to Deuteronomy in chapter 18. That's the one we were reading last week. Right? Y'all remember we read Deuteronomy last week? Okay. Two verses. Look at verse 18 and 19 in Deuteronomy chapter 18. In verse 18 he says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be, whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Most people don't have any problem understanding that these two verses here in Deuteronomy 18 are a prophecy of the Messiah to come. And it was, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, we know what that means. <clears throat> but this statement here, I will require it of him, what do we think that means? Excuse me? 
his life and what it all required of him. But we can all come to different understandings of what we think that means is what I'm getting at. But let's see what Luke thought about it. Go to Acts chapter 3. The book of Acts. In Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 22. Now remember, a common way of Hebrew teaching from the Scripture is to quote things that the prophet said or something like that, you know. And they quote these things. They didn't always say, well, so-and-so said or, or chapter 2 and verse 4. You know, they're quoting from the writings of these people because chapter and verse wasn't instituted until, you know, our society is coming to the state. But in Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 22, Luke's writing, he says, For Moses truly said to the fathers, Yahweh Eloheka will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. But then he says, And it shall come to pass that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among his people, or from among the people. Remember the word hear in the Hebrew means to hear with understanding and obey. So it's not just a matter of hearing, it's doing what it said. And Luke thought that that passage that we just looked at there from the Torah meant, you know, you shall be destroyed if you don't do hear and do what he said do. <clears throat> so we have the prophecy in Deuteronomy that he's going to send somebody. We have the word Galatians that says, if you believe in Messiah Yehoshua and accept him, then you're heirs to the promise, right? So then this one who's coming that he's prophesying is going to come is the one who's actually going to establish the covenant and give us a land. Is that right? Go to Ezekiel. Sixteen. You know that one that I've been so high on for so long. Yeah. Ezekiel chapter 16. Verse 62 and 63. <laughs> Y'all know me too well. Or I repeat myself too much. One minute. But if we go back a ways, in this chapter 16, just, just to establish one thing, look at verse 36. <laughs> We're not going to read all of that down here. But in verse 36 it said, Thus says Yahweh Elohim, who's speaking? Yeah. Yahweh, speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, right? So then when we get over in verse 62, and Yahweh says, and I will establish my covenant with you. Then you shall know, Ani Yahweh, that I am Yahweh. When I establish my covenant with you. Now up until Messiah came, the only thing that was ever done in regard to the covenant or the disposition of sin was based on animal sacrifices, right? So he's going to come to establish the covenant. And it tells us in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats and stuff could never do away with sin because if it could have been, they wouldn't have had to keep doing it all the time. So the blood of bulls and goats and animals in the sacrifice was a temporary covering of sin until Messiah should come, the one who's going to remove it. Now, and I will establish my covenant, my disposition with you, then you shall know on Yahweh, verse 63, that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your disgrace when I provide you an atonement, the propitiation for all you have done, says Adonai Yahweh. So he's establishing the covenant at the same time that he gets rid of their sins. So he establishes the covenant, the disposition. And what defines what sin is? The Torah. Now go to Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> Verse 
verses starting verse 13. Now Paul is writing to those in Rome and he writes in verse 13 of chapter 4 for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, through the Torah, but through the righteousness of faith. There is nothing that you can do in the law which will guarantee you the removal of sin, get rid of it, cover it, or give you eternal life. Is there? Is there a single law anywhere that you can do that will give you those things? So if we are doing the law right now, and remember, most people, when you talk to them in Christianity, they think you're trying to do the law so that you can earn your salvation. And we know that plainly the law, so ain't nothing you can do to earn your salvation. There ain't no law you can do. If there's any law that you can do to bring you salvation, besides it, that's come and die. But there is no law that you can do. Therefore, he had to come in order to remove your sins to give you eternal life. I mean, we know that. But here he's saying, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, the Torah, but through the righteousness of faith. The righteousness of faith. And what's the definition of faith? Trusting Yahweh. For if those who are of the law are heirs, then faith is made void and the promise is made no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. Why would that be? Because the law says, you sin, you die. Period. There ain't nothing else. The blood of an animal would temporarily cover the sin so you put off the death penalty for a while. Verse 15, because the law brings about wrath but where there is no law, there's no transgression. But the law says you shall not do this or you shall do this one or the other. And if you don't do or if you, you know, do what you're not supposed to, then the penalty is what? Death. You sin, you die. Verse 16. Therefore it is a faith that might be according to grace. And if we look at the word grace, and it just really means because of the act of kindness. You realize the act of kindness is that the one <coughs> word that spoke everything into being became flesh and came and died so that we can be saved. Is that not grace or kindness? Mm -hmm. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the Torah, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. He's saying that this whole thing is made to any and every who will accept and believe his word and walk in it. Because to believe him means to do what he said do. Without doing what he said do, there is no belief. You can say you believe all you want to, but there's not. Now go to Matthew 5. Do we believe him? You see, there's none of these scriptures that are new. I mean, maybe they're a little bit put together a little bit differently in, in what we're doing here now than what most people think or see. But in Matthew 5, in verse 17 and 18, If you can ever get a handle on these and know exactly what these two verses connect to over in Luke, because remember this is chapter 5 of Matthew before he went to the execution state, right? Before he died. And then people can say, you know, or you can say, do not think, verse 17 he says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So there's still a whole lot of things in the scripture of prophecy that has yet to be fulfilled. Then according to the words out of Messiah's mouth, the law is still for today, right? Mm -hmm. But church people will tell you, well, he fulfilled all of it, so I don't have to. Isn't that what they're saying? He fulfilled so and yet nothing that he said here has anything to do with what he told us to do. In reality, does it? What did he come to fulfill? Everything written about him. That's now when people start talking about this verse, they say, well, let's go over to Luke chapter 24. Because chapter 24 of Luke is after his death, burial, and resurrection, right? In Luke chapter 24 and in verse 44. And I, I love this because it's, 
he, he's resurrected now. He's, he's glorified. And in verse 44, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. He's with them now, right? But he's saying when I was with you in the different form. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. The only thing he can't fulfill was that which was written about him. Right? So you're, you're questioning people then, well, how did he fulfill a part that told me not to murder somebody? Are you saying that he didn't murder somebody so I can? Is that what you're saying? That, <laughs> I mean, but in reality, that's what they're saying when they say that without recognizing what they're saying. Go to Second John. Miss Margaret Tate. <laughs> In Second John, because so much of the time today in organized religion and church and all this kind of stuff, they're saying to us, you know, oh, well, we just do what the Son says. We don't have to do what the Father said, right? And they're trying to separate the Father and the Son. When you do that, is that not proof they don't have any idea who He is? And if you don't know Him, He sure don't know you. <laughs> right? So in verse 6, he, asked, he states, This is love. That we walk according to His commandments, this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. That we walk according to His commandments. Who is the His in that verse? Back up to verse 4. I rejoice greatly that I have found of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. This is Second John and they're still walking in what? The words of the Father. And they keep saying, all we have to do is what the Son says, not what the Father says. <laughs> but it's the same thing, right? Now go back to Galatians chapter 3. I really do would like to be able one day, and, and not Yahweh can, you know, whoop me for this because I guess there's a little pride in but I would love to be able to sit down sometimes with a pastor or something that keeps telling people you know Galatians teaches the law is done away with if I could just get them to sit down and say have you read Galatians <laughs> and let's sit down and read this thing together and see what it really said Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 Now, I think most everybody here that's right now has already added these words in there if they're not in your Bible. But in verse 10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, right? And we know that there's a word missing there, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the word out, O-U-T. And it should be in there because it's actually in the Greek text. And it says, For as many as are out of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Is not Galatians saying that if everybody doesn't continue in walking in obedience to the law, then they're under a curse? That's Galatians. Have you read Galatians lately? <laughs> what does that say? If you're not walking according to the law, you're under a curse. What law? And if the old one done away with, what's the new one? Verse 11, but that no one is justified. And most Bibles have a little asterisk or a number by the word justified or something there. <clears throat> I think the number is something like 1344 in the Greek. I'm not sure. But the word justified means declared righteous or innocent. So he's saying, but that no one is declared innocent by the Torah in the sight of Yahweh is evident. There is no law that you can do. Isn't that what we just read over in Romans? There is no law that you can do that would declare you innocent. For it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So if you want to be declared righteous, that only comes by what? Living by faith or trusting in his word and doing what it says to do. Verse 12, yet the law is not of faith. The law is not of faith. 
you ever stop and think about it, the law is just a set of rules. You shall do or you shall not do. That's all the law is. It ain't got to do with anything. He obviously said do or don't. But then he said, this is going to come to pass, though, in your life based on whether you do or don't. If you do, the blessings come. If you don't, the curses come. Your choice. Has that got to do with faith, or is that just the way it is? That's a fact. The law is not a faith, quote, but the man who does them shall live or have life by them. The man who does in obedience to his instructions shall have life by what he does. Because his blessings come through our obedience to that word. And that blessing is what? Life forevermore. Isn't that great? Verse 13, the Mashiach, Christ, has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now what's the curse of the law? You sin, you, you sin, you die. Has redeemed us from that curse, having become a curse for us, for it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. My goodness, we read something about that today, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Hang on a tree. So then he became cursed for us, right? Well, now wait a minute. When people say he got rid of the curse of the law, what was the curse of the law? You sin, you die. So he got rid of that part, which means you sin, you don't die. Now what do you do? You confess your sin to him. He's faithful to forgive, and you live. But because of what he did. <clears throat> and he's saying that in verse 14. Why? That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Messiah Yehoshua, that we might receive the promise of the spirit or the promise of the breath through faith. The breath is what? The covenant, the word established. Yahweh's word, right? Life everlasting. And it's the promise that Yahweh made to Abraham. And here he's explaining to these things, you know, that's why the promise can come to you. But if you don't accept Messiah Yehoshua, then what do you get? Then you're not an heir to the promise. It's through Messiah Yehoshua that we have what he promised us we can have. Have you read Galatians lately? I mean, this is, I think it's kind of, you know, neat stuff here. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Verse. One little verse. Verse 17. Today is Shabbat Shabbat, right? From that time, Yehoshua began to preach and to say, Repent, Shabbat, turn back in obedience to the Torah, is what that word means. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Messiah came and saying, Repent and turn back. Why? Because the kingdom, the kingdom comes into existence because of what he's fixing to do for all of us. Everything has been prophesying from Torah through the prophets right up to the time of Messiah is going to come to do that. Every prophet that Yahweh ever sent to his people, they said what? Repent and turn back in obedience to Yahweh's word. He has no desire that people should die, but he wants them to repent and turn back to his word. You know, that's a preach. <laughs> Some pretty good stuff. <clears throat> Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now go back to Matthew 3. The word repent in the Greek is the number 3341. Okay? But the word 3341 in the Greek text also means to show the fruit of regeneration. Okay, now, in Matthew 3, in verse 7, he says, <laughs> But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, he's saying, you descendants of snakes, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
He say, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? <clears throat> Go to the Gospel of John in chapter 3. Gospel of John in chapter 3, verse 1, he said, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, of the Yehudi. It means he was a leader. This man came to Yehoshua by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from Yahweh, for no one can do these signs that you do unless Yahweh is with him. He said, I know nobody can do what you do unless Yahweh is in it. Verse 3, Yehoshua answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of Yahweh. The word born is the number 1080, 1080. It's the Greek word, genao. It only means two things. Literally, it means procreated. That's a natural birth of a child. The other meaning is the word regeneration. You have to be regenerated. You have to be changed from what you are back to what you're supposed to be. The word that's translated again Unless he is born again. The word again is a number 509. The Greek word anothen. In the Greek he's saying genao anothen. And that word that's translated again actually means from above. From above. We got in our English Bible born again. In the Greek he's saying most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is genao anothen, unless one is regenerated from above, he cannot see the kingdom of Yahweh. Regenerated from above. How does this regeneration from above work? Remember when he spoke to Peter? And he asked Peter, he said, Who do you think I am? And he said, You are the Mashiach. The son of the living of Yahweh. He said, what? Flesh and blood has not shown this to you, but my Father in heaven. And he said, on this is what I'm going to build my ecclesia. It's revelation knowledge from the Father to Peter of who he was. That's what he's building his ecclesia called out on. Revelation knowledge of who he is. Is he the word made flesh? If he's the word made flesh, then he's the one that wrote those words on the stone with his finger. He's the one that gave us these commandments. He's the one that said in the Gospel of John, if you love me, keep my commandments. Who is he? If you don't know who he is, you don't know what in the world you're supposed to do. And the people run around out there trying to separate the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of who they are, then they're breaking it down into this trinity. What are they doing? They're fracturing the truth. Splitting it all up. They don't know who he is. And since they don't know who he is, they don't know what they're supposed to do. And since they don't know who he is, then he said, if you had known the Father, you'd know me. But they didn't know the Father. And they don't know him. And in the last days, he says, men, you're going to come to me and say, we did this and we did that in your name. What's he going to say to them? Depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice transgression of the law. Are we doing the law in order to earn our deliverance? No. Are we doing the law because we want to keep what he gave us? And what is love? Obedient to Yahweh's word. <clears throat> go, uh, go back to Galatians. <laughs>
I'm going to cut it off right here. I'm going to let, I'm going to let y'all just relax now after this one. <clears throat> Galatians 3, verses 15 through 18. And he said, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it's only a man's covenant, yet if it's confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. If it's a disposition, if it's established, no one annuls or adds to it. My goodness. I thought it'd be short today. Well, it had been. <clears throat> Again, verse 15, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it's only a man's covenant, yet if it, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. The covenant was the promise that Yahweh made to Abraham, right? If it is confirmed, was this covenant not confirmed to the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah according to Ezekiel 16, 62, and 63? He said he did it, right? Verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He did not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is the Mashiach. So really the promise is to him because when he was raised up from the dead, he became what? King of the whole earth, right? And everything belongs to him. And if we are in him and he is in us, then what belongs to us? Everything that belongs to him. Is there anything that doesn't belong to him. And if we're in him, is there anything that doesn't belong to us? Can, is there a beauty in that? I mean, in, in the whole, you know, in, in what it is? <clears throat> I mean, we used to hear people say all these things in the world about you're a king's kid, but they have no more idea about what that means than nothing. <clears throat> and in verse 17, he says, And this I say, the Torah, which was 430 years later, the Torah was given 430 years after the promise to Abraham. Cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by Yahweh and the Mashiach that it should make the promise of no effect. The law does not annul the promise that was made to Yahweh. I mean, to Abraham by Yahweh. Verse 18, for if the inheritance is of the Torah, it's no longer a promise, but Yahweh gave it to Abraham by promise. And now go back to verse 29. And if you are the Mashiach, if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed, or heirs, and heirs according <coughs> to the promise. And that concludes your readings for this day. Yeah. You made a statement earlier about the circumcision of the African women. Yeah. And, what, and I don't think that's what it means. What? No, I'm saying that that's a mutilation, not not really, yeah. but I'm just saying those people are involved in mutilation, but that same type of mutilation is what this, this Hebrew word is referring to as a mutilation. Well, you made the statement that, uh, that caused the other men not to want them. I'm saying that was the reason why the men do that to their women in the first place, was so, excuse me, go ahead. Uh, no, actually, well, what I have read, to put it that way, is that it was so the women would not enjoy sex and they would be faithful. Yeah. They didn't have to worry about them running around. Yeah, that well, yeah, that's what they said. But the other thing too was so that the men wouldn't want them because if they know that they're not going to.